Good morning. Good morning and welcome, Acting Committee Chairperson, members, and guests. I am Maria Ellis, the Executive Secretary for the Medicare Evidence Development and Coverage Advisory Committee, known as MedCAC. The committee is here today to discuss recommendations regarding the appraisal of the state of evidence for health outcomes in the Medicare population for surgical and endoscopic procedures for weight loss. The following announcement addresses conflict of interest issues associated with this meeting and is made part of the record. The conflict of interest statutes prohibit special government employees from participating in matters that could affect their or their employer's financial interests. Each member will be asked to disclose any financial conflicts of interest during their introduction. We ask in the interest of fairness that all persons making statements or presentations disclose if you or any member of your immediate family own stock or have another formal financial interest in any company, including an internet or e-commerce organizations that develops, manufactures, distributes, and or markets consulting, evidence reviews or analyses, or other services related to bariatric procedures, including surgical, laparoscopic, and endoscopic with or without devices. This includes direct financial investments, consulting fees, and significant institutional support. If you have not already, received a disclosure statement, they are available on the table outside of the auditorium. We ask that all presenters please adhere to their time limits. We have numerous presenters to hear from today in a very tight agenda and therefore cannot allow extra time. There is a timer at the podium that you should follow. The light will begin flashing when there are two minutes remaining and then turn red when your time is up. Please note that there is a chair for the next speaker and please proceed to that chair when it is your turn. We ask that all speakers addressing the panel, please speak directly into the mic and state your name. For the record, voting members present for today's meeting are Dr. Karen Albright, Dr. Doug Campos Outcult, Dr. Mark Mora, Dr. Daniel Ollendorf, Dr. Marcel Salive, Dr. Renee Williams, Dr. Adolph Yates Jr., and Dr. Diana Suckerman. A quorum is present and no one has been recused because of conflicts of interest. The entire panel including non-voting members, will participate in the voting. The voting results will be available on our website following the meeting. I ask that all panel members please speak directly into the mics. This meeting is being webcast via CMS in addition to the transcriptionists. By your attendance, you are given consent to the use and distribution of your name, likeliness, and voice during the meeting. You are also given consent to the use and distribution of any personally identifiable information that you or others may disclose about you during today's meeting. Please do not disclose personal health information. In the spirit of the Federal Advisory Committee Act and <laughs> the Government in the Sunshine Act, we ask that the advisory committee members take heed that their conversations about the topic at hand take place in the open forum of the meeting. We are aware that members of the audience, including the media, are anxious to speak with the panel about these proceedings. However, CMS and the committee will refrain from discussing the details of this meeting with the media until its conclusion. Also, the committee is reminded to please refrain from discussing the meeting topics during breaks and at lunch. 
If you require a taxi cab, there are number, telephone numbers to local cab companies at the desk outside of the auditorium. Please remember to discard your trash in the trash cans located outside of this room. And lastly, <coughs> all CMS guests attending today's MedCAC meeting are only permitted in the following areas of CMS single site. The main lobby, the auditorium, the lower level lobby, and the cafeteria. Any persons found in any area other than those mentioned will be asked to leave the conference and will not be allowed back on CMS property again. And now, I would like to turn the meeting over to Ms. Lori Ashby. Thank you and good morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome our panel, our invited speakers, and everybody else in attendance here today. This is a topic that's very important to our a population that we serve, the Medicare population, and I'm assuming to the rest of you in the room with us. So thank you so much for being here. We have a very packed and robust agenda today. We're looking forward to this meeting. And without further ado, I'd like to turn the meeting over to our esteemed chair, Dr. Aloysius Kuje. Thank you, Dr. Kuje. Good morning. <clears throat> I don't know about the esteemed part, uh, but welcome <laughs> everybody. Um, I guess this is my fifth MedCAC meeting and they've all been interesting in terms of the presentations. And, and discussions, um, and they've all addressed important questions for, for the Medicare population. So I would ask everyone to pay attention to the presentations. Uh, there'll be some back and forth with, with questions at some point, and at the end of the day, we'll be able to make some recommendations in, in, based on what the presentations support. Thank you. We're going to introduce all the panel, panel members. We'll start. Sure. I'm Karen Albright. I'm from the University of Alabama at Birmingham. I'm sorry. When, um, panel members, when you introduce yourself, could you please disclose your financial? Oh, and I have no disclosures. So. I have no relevant financial disclosures. <clears throat> Doug Campus, out called University of Arizona College of Public Health. I have uh, no, no conflicts. Good morning, everybody. I'm Mark Moore from Kaiser Permanente in Washington, and I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. Good morning. Uh, Dan Ollendorf with the Institute for Clinical and Economic Review in Boston. We receive institutional support to do evidence synthesis and economic evaluation, and we have dealt with bariatric and obesity-related topics in the past. No other conflicts to disclose. Good morning. I'm Marcel Salive. Uh, from the National Institute on Aging, which is part of NIH. I have no conflicts. Good morning. I'm Renee Williams from New York University School of Medicine. I own stock in Boston Scientific, and I have no other conflicts to disclose. Adolf Yates, University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, no conflicts of uh, financial interest. Diana Zuckerman, National Center for Health Research. I have stock in Johnson & Johnson. Good morning, all. Bob Hilkert from Novartis Pharmaceutical. I'm the industry representative of this panel, and I'm a full-time employee of Novartis Pharmaceutical Corporation. Good morning. I'm Martha Betts. I'm a biomedical engineer at the FDA, and I have nothing to disclose. Sam Klein, Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis. I am a shareholder and consultant for Aspire Bariatrics. I also receive grant support for, from Johnson & Johnson for metabolic studies and obesity and a consultant for Janssen Pharmaceuticals. I'm Dana Tellum. I'm at the University of Michigan and I've been a consultant for Medtronic. I'm uh, Bruce Wolf from Oregon Health and Science University in Portland. Uh, no disclosure. All right, the first presentation is going to be by <coughs> Sarah Fulton. Um. <coughs> and before she starts, can the next speaker occupy the chair that Maria pointed out? Be much appreciated. <coughs> Good morning. Uh, my name is Sarah Fulton. I'm an analyst in the coverage and analysis group here at CMS. Thank you all for joining today's meeting. We're looking forward to productive discussions around this very important and complex topic. 
Medicare currently has two national coverage determinations for services related to treatments for comorbid conditions related to obesity. NCD 100.1, bariatric surgery for treatment of morbid mm -hmm. obesity, covers open and laparoscopic Roux-en-Y gastric bypass, open and laparoscopic biliopancreatic diversion with duodenal switch or gastric reduction duodenal switch, and laparoscopic adjustable gastric banding. Eligible beneficiaries must have a BMI of 35 or greater, at least one comorbidity related to obesity, and have been previously unsuccessful with medical treatment for obesity. NCD 100.1 also non-covers treatments for obesity alone, supplemental fasting as a general treatment for obesity, open adjustable gastric banding, open sleeve gastrectomy, open and laparoscopic vertical banded gastroplasty, intestinal bypass surgery, and gastric balloon for treatment of obesity. Under this NCD, and for beneficiaries with a BMI of 35 or greater, and at least one comorbidity related to obesity, and who have been previously unsuccessful with medical treatment for obesity, Medicare administrative contractors have discretion to determine coverage for standalone laparoscopic sleeve gastrectomy for the treatment of comorbid conditions related to obesity. The MACs also have discretion to determine coverage for any bariatric surgery procedures not specifically covered or non-covered through an NCD. NCD 21012, Intensive Behavioral Therapy for Obesity, covers intensive behavioral therapy consisting of dietary assessment and intensive behavioral counseling and behavioral therapy to promote sustained weight loss through high intensity interventions on diet and exercise for beneficiaries with a BMI of 30 or greater. Beneficiaries must be competent and alert at the time of counseling and counseling must be provided in a primary care setting and by a primary care physician or other primary care practitioner. CMS covers one face-to-face -face visit during the first month of services, one face-to-face -face visit every other, I'm sorry, one face-to-face -face visit each week for the first month of services, one face-to-face -face visit every other week for months two through six, and then one face-to-face -face visit every month for the last six months of the program should the beneficiary achieve a weight loss of three kilograms during the first six months of services. Despite evidence assessing surgical bariatric therapy, therapies, evidentiary questions remain regarding clinically meaningful health outcomes for Medicare beneficiaries and informed decision making for patients. It is important to identify the information beneficiaries need to make informed treatment decisions with their providers. As such, it is important to facilitate meaningful health outcomes to address outstanding evidentiary questions so as to inform Medicare coverage policies and, very importantly, to assist beneficiaries in making informed decisions with their providers and about their own care. This figure from Boyd Swinburne and colleagues' first article in a series on obesity from The Lancet in 2011 highlights the complexity of obesity the, and the wide range of influencing factors that, depending upon each individual's situation, may encourage or impede improvements and reductions in the prevalence of obesity. The purpose of today's meeting is to obtain recommendations from the MedCAC regarding the appraisal of the state of evidence for health outcomes in the Medicare population for surgical and endoscopic procedures for weight loss. Of particular importance is the identification of evidence gaps related to treatments for obesity and related comorbidities and discussion of efforts aimed at patient-centered care. Today we will discuss clinical study endpoints and patient outcomes, both weight loss and non-weight loss related, duration of intervention effects, evidence gaps, how these elements impact patient decision making, and how to provide support for patient decision making. In the afternoon session, the panel will vote and provide additional discussion on the following questions. When voting, one is equivalent to low confidence and five is equivalent to high confidence. Voting question number one. How confident are you that the following are meaningful primary health outcomes in, weight, in research studies of bariatric surgery? A, weight loss. B, post-operative complications. C, diabetes and metabolic outcomes. D, cardiovascular outcomes. E, respiratory outcomes, F, musculoskeletal outcomes, and G, quality of life. 
Voting question number two. How confident are you that there is sufficient evidence for an intervention to include open laparoscopic surgeries and endoscopic procedures where the benefit outweighs the harm for short-term weight loss, defined as two years or less from surgery, mid-term weight loss, defined as more than two but less than five years from surgery, long-term weight loss, more than five years after surgery? For outcomes listed in question one with a voting score of greater than 2.5, how confident are you that there is sufficient evidence for an intervention to include open and laparoscopic surgeries and endoscopic procedures where the benefit outweighs the harm for short-term outcomes, mid-term outcomes, and long-term outcomes? Voting question number four. How confident are you that the predictors of success in the Medicare population, such as patient characteristics and pre and post procedure standards of care for any bariatric therapy is known? An additional discussion list the predictors of success and the correspondent strength of evidence. And then three additional discussion questions for the day. One, discuss important evidence gaps that have not been previously or sufficiently addressed. Two, discuss any known treatment disparities. Three, considering both existing and new procedures and devices as well as potential barriers to care, discuss any mechanisms that might be supported by CMS that would more quickly generate an improved evidence base that would underpin improved care and decision making for the Medicare population affected by obesity. Thank you. Our next, next presenter is uh, Dr. Eric DeMaria. Good morning. My name is Eric DeMaria. I'm a bariatric surgeon in Richmond, Virginia, and uh, an officer, an elected officer of the American Society for Metabolic and Bariatric Surgery. Um, my assignment was to talk about surgical and endoscopic procedures and to prevent, present evidence. Uh, my disclosures are uh, essentially speaking on our area from several companies involved in the field. So I've been given a broad assignment uh, to begin with the basics of bariatric surgery procedures and proceed all the way to the highest available level, level of evidence supporting uh, issues with those procedures. Uh, we're going to talk about procedure outcomes, durability, safety, survival issues. We're going to focus on comorbidity uh, treatment issues, and we're going to talk about quality and patient safety. We're going to also touch on some of the newer treatments, uh, including the endoscopic treatments that have been mentioned. Obesity is a chronic disease. Um, there are a number of major healthcare organizations that have come out to state this emphatically, including our American Medical Association in 2013. Uh, from the Endocrine Society, obesity is among the most common and costly chronic disorders worldwide. Estimates suggest that in the United States, obesity affects one-third of adults, accounts for up to one-third of total mortality, and is concentrated among lower-income groups and affects children as well as adults. Uh, this disease requires treatment. Uh, and we're going to talk about various interventions and also uh, the concept of a continuum of care uh, for obese persons. Now, this is the Bariatric Surgery 101 portion of my talk. This is the four most commonly done surgical procedures. Uh, and we're going to mention two terms that uh, underpin uh, the classic understanding of procedures, malabsorption, which involves intestinal bypass to some extent to decrease nutrient absorption, to the concept of restriction, uh, which is gastric surgery to reduce the gastric eating capacity. So this uh, profile of procedures uh, from left to right from the duodenal switch operation through to the adjustable gastric band is increasing levels of restriction and decreasing levels of malabsorption. Again, I'm talking in a classic sense, and I'll explain that more in a minute. Typically, restrictive procedures have less weight loss than malabsorptive procedures, so there's a spectrum 
of outcome there. And then also one of the reasons behind the development of restrictive procedures was to try and reduce surgical risk and long-term nutritional risk in the patient population. So the more restrictive, typically the less risk of malnutrition, for example. Well, there's obviously a continuum of the disease of obesity. And our focus with surgery has traditionally been on the body mass index of 40 or greater patient population. But there's a large population of patients in uh, the lower range of BMI from 30 to 40. And this is perhaps where procedures like the intragastric balloon, the endoscopic procedures, and the less invasive procedures fit. Uh, as seen here as new FDA-approved interventions. And I'm going to cluster these procedures now to the right on that spectrum of care because they tend to demonstrate overall less weight loss than the invasive surgical procedures, but at the same time uh, potentially demonstrate lower risk of complications, better safety profiles. So that's, in my view, where they fit on the spectrum of care. Well, I mentioned the classic terms of restriction and malabsorption, and there is an active discussion in our specialty as to whether those terms are even appropriate today. Because what we have learned is that there are metabolic and physiologic mechanisms that underlie the effectiveness of these procedures, specifically in the area of gut hormones that are affected by most of the procedures that we use today. Interestingly on the list is the idea that you can consume lower calories but preserve your energy expenditure, which is notably different than most diet approaches to weight loss treatment. And of course, the emerging evidence in the microbiome that what we do to the gut may actually influence the microbiome, which will lead to changes in body weight. So this is uh, some evidence Talking about diet, the television show that obviously receives a lot of attention, The Biggest Loser, and this is an example of what was published regarding the six-year outcomes of those individuals from the TV program who had drastic weight loss uh, induced by diet and exercise. And as we look at the results of 30 weeks versus six years, what you will see is that there is one individual that developed, that demonstrated persistent successful weight loss, as opposed to the metabolic adaptation phenomenon that led to weight regain in every other individual who uh, had the motivation to appear on television to lose weight. That individual was the one individual who underwent bariatric surgery in this cohort of patients. So we have a spectrum of gut hormones that are affected by our GI surgical procedures, and this is beyond the scope of this presentation to go into great detail, but they have effects on satiety, they have effects on the GI tract, and they have effects on the central nervous system that probably underpin our uh, surgical treatment methodologies. And uh, Lee Kaplan from Harvard has spent a lot of time and effort studying the mechanisms, again, beyond the scope of our presentation today, but it is very likely that our concepts of restriction are actually misleading. For example, sleeve gastrectomy seen on the right here in this slide, one would think that this would delay gastric emptying and be a restrictive procedure. However, we actually see accelerated gastric emptying, accelerated nutrient exposure to the small bowel, and therefore changes in the gut hormones which tend to support uh, weight loss over time. So let's plunge into outcome data now that we've had that whirlwind introduction to bariatric surgery procedures. And let's look at uh, long-term outcomes with the various procedures. Uh, this is a, sub, a study I'm going to refer to repeatedly this morning, the Swedish Obese Subjects Study in Sweden, which is a prospective controlled interventional study of bariatric surgery. The reason to focus on this is our focus here will be on long-term outcomes. And this study has been going on now for many years in Sweden. So uh, right off the bat, we see a difference in survival between the control population and the surgically treated population with an adjusted hazard ratio of 0.71 for the surgically treated patients. 
Now here's an example of the surgical procedures that were done in that trial showing uh, that banding and vertical banded gastroplasty, specifically VBG, an operation that is really no longer performed, were the main procedures. But you can see the example of weight loss that we have here, persistence of a 20% loss of uh, body weight in the banding category and closer to 30% long term in the gastric bypass treated uh, population and an effect on comorbidities long-term with a reduction in diabetes in the surgically treated cohort, uh, most notably. When we look at the various results that have been published from the SOS trial, we see a reduction in mortality uh, that did not matter if the BMI was above or below the median BMI of the patient population, a reduction in cardiovascular mortality, a dramatic reduction in cancer mortality uh, in this uh, study, and diabetes prevention with a hazard ratio in the 0 0.2 to 0.25 percent uh, range. So um, these, this is not the only study that looks at long-term outcome regarding survival. Uh, Christo from Canada looked at uh, survival long-term, found an 89% reduction in mortality in the surgically tr treated cohort compared to the non-surgical cohort, and uh, FLUM in the United States in Washington State, a 33% reduction in death uh, after four years. Uh, Adam's study in Utah in the United States is extremely meaningful as far as survival. Uh, an adjusted mortality decrease of 40% in the surgically treated cohort of patients, a reduction in coronary artery disease of 56%, diabetes of 92%, and cancer of 60% in that study. So let's uh, go on to look at weight loss and comorbidity outcomes of the commonly performed procedures and emphasize the long-term follow-up that we have available. So in reviewing the literature for the procedure of gastric bypass and focusing on studies that have five or more years of follow-up, within the last five years we identified 38 peer-reviewed publications that demonstrate a, a range of weight loss, excess weight loss between 50 and 72 percent, total body weight loss in the range of 19 to 35 percent, and the follow-up range from 5 to 14 years uh, post-op. So I'm going to give you some uh, representative uh, studies here that reflect the body of evidence that we have uh, with the gastric bypass. This is a procedure by Hempens showing the weight loss results over time going out to uh, nine years. The excess BMI lost 56.2 percent, diabetes resolution 80 percent, and uh, new onset diabetes in 27 percent, and no link between weight regain and the idea of new onset uh, diabetes from this trial. Here's uh, 10 to 13 year data looking at 134 patients at 10 or more years after gastric bypass with reduction of excess weight in the range of 59%, diabetes of 58%, dyslipidemias 46%, and hypertension 46%. And you can see the, uh, the weight loss result curve there. Um, 11-year results in 384 patients after primary gastric bypass. You can see the excess BMI points lost on the uh, y-axis of the graph going out to uh, as much as 17 years after gastric bypass surgery with a reduction in diabetes of 72% and triglyceridemia of 62%. Shifting gears a little bit to the vertical sleeve gastrectomy procedure, uh, although a newer procedure in the bariatric spectrum of procedures, uh, we have recently reviewed this and found, ironically, the same number, 38 peer-reviewed <laughs> studies that provide five or more years of follow-up available in over 2,000 patients. The excess weight loss with this procedure ranged from 37 to 86 percent. And uh, this is a table just showing the various 
um, studies and the weight loss results, the, um, I don't know if I can use this as a pointer, the, the weight loss at the end of the follow-up period is listed and ranges from 40% excess weight loss up into the 80% or more range uh, in these trials, and they're all listed individually here uh, and here on this uh, slide. I know it's a busy slide. Everyone should hopefully have copies of the presentation for you to peruse at your leisure. Um, adjustable gastric banding procedure. Uh, we actually have some randomized controlled trial data from this procedure, and there are now 17 studies in the surgical literature that provide 10-year follow-up uh, outcomes of the adjustable gastric band procedure. So here's one of the randomized trials looking at gastric band surgery in overweight patients, not obese, and this is just given as an example of the lower BMI uh, cohort of patients with 30 to 40 uh, range. And that uh, top left graph demonstrates the weight changes in the uh, surgical arm with significant weight reduction, uh, as this was diabetic patients, so in the second graph at the top right, you see the hemoglobin A1C uh, depressed significantly by the surgical treatment uh, of these patients. Uh, there has been a, a randomized controlled trial comparing the adjustable gastric band to the Roux and Y gastric bypass procedure, uh, and uh, this is an example of the weight loss data in the top graph. Uh, here, but to summarize, the Ruy gastric bypass was found to be superior to the band in terms of excess weight loss, 76% versus 46% at 10-year follow-up. The bypass uh, had a higher early complication rate than the band at 8% versus zero, and there are some potentially uh, lethal long-term effects of gastric bypass, as I mentioned previously, the risk profile is higher with that type of procedure versus the gastric banding procedure. Um, here's a study looking at reoperations, a systematic review, uh, looking at reoperations in the adjustable gastric banding population. Uh, the uh, reoperation rate uh, with the gastric band is 23%. Uh, at the end of long-term follow-up in this uh, review article, uh, and that is seen in the uh, right-hand graph. You see the explantation rate at 23% uh, with this long-term follow-up study. Excess weight loss in the 40 to 50% range in this long-term study. The Swedish adjustable gastric band 10-year experience has been reported to be similar. Here's data out to seven and eight years after that procedure with uh, BMI averaging in the range of 30 uh, with that uh, trial here. And then complications were the focus of this uh, study looking at uh, 785 patients. Uh, a rate of esophagitis of 29% was the greatest, most frequent complication. Uh, then about 10% port problems and so forth on down the line. Again, this is information you should have to be able to review in more detail. And then reoperations uh, for such problems as pouch dilatation, port problems, band migration in the range of about five to six percent. Just a couple more studies. The red here uh, is lost to follow up. The black lines are, are band removals seen at a single center. Uh, over the course of up to 16 years after surgery, and there is a progressive increase in the removal of the adjustable gastric band for, over time. Here's another where the red line is the band removal rate uh, out to 19 years after uh, adjustable gastric banding, and, uh, and therefore clearly one could draw the <coughs> conclusion that banding does not work for every patient. Um, so uh, another identified group that potentially is problematic with the adjustable gastric band is the high BMI population. This is a study of the super obese, 186 patients with a BMI of 50 or greater. 
looking at band removal, and you can see a progressive increase over time out to 14 years after surgery. Uh, in addition, there's been a publication from the Michigan group looking specifically at Medicare, uh, both uh, population and expenditures for the adjustable gastric band. And uh, what you see on the bottom left, uh, that phenomenon is the costs for application of the adjustable gastric band. And the dark bar is the index procedures, the white Part of the bar is the reoperative procedures, and you can see a shift with decrease in the index procedure costs and an increase in the reoperative costs. Overall, the costs have declined over the years, probably as the adjustable ga gastric band begins to assume its appropriate frequency in the obese population as compared to some years ago where it was uh, widely applied. Uh, to complete the four procedures, the duodenal switch, 14 studies now published with more than five-year follow-up, uh, 3,700 patients followed from five to 20 years, excess weight loss ranging from 63 to 93%, and then uh, a subset of super-obese patients, BMI greater than 40 demonstrating excess weight loss greater than 64%, which is significant as far as how effective this operation is for the super obese. Again, the same kind of very busy table looking at the outcomes of the uh, duodenal switch for the various studies uh, that I've just summarized uh, very briefly. And you can see the long-term follow-up demonstrates 60 to 90% reduction of excess weight in this population. There are uh, randomized trials looking at duodenal switch compared to, for example, here, gastric bypass. And uh, typically, uh, the result is as seen here, where the weight loss is somewhat superior with the duodenal switch operation carried out to uh, long-term follow-up here of 50, uh, I'm sorry, 60 months follow-up. So let's transition a little bit into comorbidities. This is reverting back to the SOS trial uh, data looking at remission of type 2 diabetes, the control group in green, the surgical cohort in blue, and out to 10 years. So there's a uh, significant decrease in the um, incidence of diabetes and an increase in the remission of diabetes in the surgically treated uh, cohort. Another interesting finding in the prevention of new onset diabetes, a protective effect of surgical treatment uh, versus the control uh, cohort of patients as seen here. This is a look at both microvascular and macrovascular complications of diabetes from the SOS data showing the, the various uh, control and surgically treated groups and how they differentiate. On the left is microvascular diabetes complications and on the right is macrovascular complications, so a benefit of surgical treatment. Uh, this is the uh, 11 randomized controlled trials looking at surgical versus medical treatment of type 2 diabetes with a, a total N of 794 patients. Uh, and uh, you can see the various uh, remission criteria listed in terms of hemoglobin A1C for the most part uh, in these studies. Um, the far right is the, uh, the attainment of the goal of remission as defined by A1C. And, and one striking feature of these uh, trials is how infrequently the control group attains the goal of remission. Uh, the highest rate uh, in these studies is 16%, I'm sorry, 23% uh, of the non-surgically treated control group attained the remission objective. Uh, as opposed to the surgically treated arm where the, the results typically are in the range of 50 to 70 percent attaining the goal of diabetes remission. So fairly compelling uh, high-level evidence of the benefit of surgical treatment for diabetes versus medical treatment. One representative study we'll spend a moment on is, is the um, 
five-year results of the stampede trial. And here we have three arms in this randomized trial, medical therapy, gastric bypass, and vertical sleeve gastrectomy. Both bypass and sleeve demonstrated superiority in terms of attainment of hemoglobin A1C less than 6%. The bypass group 29%, the sleeve 23%, the medical treatment goal, uh, the medical treatment group 5%. And often this was done without medications. As you can see in the second row, the hemoglobin A1C less than 6%. None of the medical treatment group attained that clearly. The bypass 22%, the sleeve 15%. Both of these outcomes significant. Hemoglobin A1C over the course of five years, the top uh, line is the medical treatment cohort. The gastric bypass and sleeve are clustered at the lower ends with more dramatic reductions in hemoglobin A1C persistent out to five years. And of course, this is in the setting of significant weight loss. So here's the change in body mass index found in the medical group with very little change. And then the surgical groups, the two surgical cohorts of band and uh, uh, sorry, bypass and, and sleeve demonstrating significant uh, weight loss. And then uh, just another interesting observation, uh, it doesn't seem to matter if your body mass index is in the classic range for surgical treatment of a BMI of 35 or more, or less than 35 in the presence of diabetes. Uh, the surgically treated groups are seen at the bottom the medical treatment groups are seen at the top of this graph, and there is no difference between the two BMI ranges studied. Um, adverse events were at a low rate in the surgically treated uh, population despite the invasiveness of surgery. So here's a uh, meta-analysis summarizing all studies of metabolic surgery that have looked at diabetes, 94 studies, nearly 95,000 surgical patients, uh, studies that have BMI less than 35 are clustered at the top. Studies where the body mass index is in the more traditional range for bariatric surgery at 35 or greater. The diabetes remission rate 71% in the classic group and then in the low BMI population 72%. Really no difference in diabetes outcome uh, between the two BMI groups. Um, the AHRQ has done a systematic review of this uh, that I'm not going to spend much time on, just uh, supporting the idea that diabetes treatment uh, is potentially beneficial uh, with low BMI patient population. So here's, uh, again, the odds ratio of diabetes remission in the 11 randomized trials of surgery versus medications or lifestyle change. Uh, on the right, you can see as you go down this list, the BMI is ascending, and uh, there's the division between BMI less than 35 and more than 35. Again, really no difference. Uh, to the right is the outcomes that favor the surgical treatment, and that is true of every study uh, that has looked at this question. Uh, surgical superiority is similar in BMI less than 35 and greater than 35. The uh, American Diabetes Association and 45 other diabetes treatment organizations around the world have endorsed uh, some changes in their recommendations regarding consideration of surgery for uh, treatment of the comorbidity of diabetes. Metabolic surgery for type 2 diabetes should be recommended for patients with BMI greater than or equal to 40, regardless of glycemic control, recommended for patients with BMI greater than or equal to 35 with inadequately controlled hyperglycemia, which unfortunately is all too common the case today uh, in our country, considered for lower body mass index patients with inadequately controlled hyperglycemia in the BMI 30 to 34.9 range, and then the specific mention of the Asian population in which diabetes tends to uh, begin at lower levels of BMI with a uh, BMI as low as 27.5 for those patients who have inadequate control of hyperglycemia. So a treatment algorithm 
uh, has changed uh, with the institution of new ADA guidelines uh, that favor the idea of at least consideration of surgery uh, to treat this metabolic disease at lower BMI uh, levels. So in conclusion, the evidence for metabolic <laughs> surgery is for type 2 diabetes is very good and supported by randomized controlled trials. And we have these widely endorsed international guidelines uh, that include evidence-based recommend recommendations for surgery to treat diabetes and other comorbidities. And this con has been considered uh, by other payers. Uh, the California Technology Assessment Forum has considered surgery for diabetes in BMI less than 35 patients, and their panel uh, voted uh, unanimously uh, that the evidence is adequate to demonstrate the net health benefit of bariatric surgery is greater than conventional weight loss management. So uh, turn now to the comorbidity of cardiovascular disease. Uh, surgical weight loss impacts cardiovascular disease by a number of mechanisms. Uh, odds ratio here <coughs> for various outcomes from a cardiovascular standpoint uh, here seen an odds ratio of comparing non-surgical controls and mortality for patients who had bariatric surgery of 0 0.48, uh, a um, reduction in MI in the odds ratio of 0 0.46, stroke 0 0.49 uh, with various studies. Uh, here is the uh, look at fatal cardiovascular events seen on the left-hand side over time, the hazard ratio in the surgically treated group, 0 0.56, and total cardiovascular events less impressive at 0 0.83. Um, and uh, in this table, which is very busy, I understand, uh, the top line in each of the two sections is the surgery uh, yes versus no, outcome for cardiovascular events seen on the top left in the middle is MI and on the right is stroke. The hazard ratio for cardiovascular events 0 0.47 surgery compared to no surgery uh, in this uh, compilation of data. So quite a, quite a bit of evidence that surgery reduces uh, the cardiovascular risk in patients who have been treated that way. Um, Heart failure is a big issue in the United States. More than <laughs> 4 million hospitalizations for heart failure with a 20 to 50 percent readmission rate. And uh, when you look at uh, outcomes from a cardiac function standpoint, you see improvement in the ejection fraction in the surgically treated cohort post-operatively. And then here's a look at weight loss and heart failure with the procedure of gastric bypass compared to lifestyle and medication treatments, and, and a significant decrease uh, in the uh, issues related to heart failure with the surgical treatment uh, group. And then this is a look at emergency department visits and hospitalizations for heart failure. The line down the middle is the division line of bariatric surgery being applied. So a fairly significant decrease in the rate of ED visits or hospitalization for heart failure exacerbations in the 24 months following bariatric surgery. Let's turn our attention. I know this seems like a whirlwind. Believe me, I'm exhausted. Uh, trying to do this. Let's turn to cancer. Um, there's uh, obviously cancers that have a strong obesity uh, link in terms of their, uh, their development and uh, intentional weight loss is emerging as a strategy for cancer therapy as well as cancer prevention. Um, so we'll look here uh, at the SOS study again. We keep reverting back to this. There's a difference between males and females in terms of reduction of cancer. Uh, on the right is the uh, female patient population from that study. Uh, looking at the cumulative cancer index is depressed. 
uh, by surgical treatment. Uh, this is particularly noteworthy because we're talking about the older population with the far right hand of this diagram looking at non-gastric bypass compared to gastric bypass. This is the data from Utah in the United States and a very significant reduction in the hazard ratio of uh, cancer uh, in the surgically treated cohort. Um, again, it tends to be um, in some studies more prevalent in females, but in this study as well included with males. So again, I've identified here the age 55 to 74 population. This is from Utah once again. Overall, a reduction in all cause risk of uh, mortality, but specifically cancer-related death, the hazard ratio 0.54 in the surgically treated uh, cohort of patients. So let's look at a meta-analysis of uh, cancer, six observational studies comparing the relative risk of cancer in bariatric surgery patients versus controls. Uh, again, a, a striking uh, positive outcome for the female patient population with the uh, relative risk being 0 0.68 for women uh, versus men. Uh, and here you see a uh, graphical representation of the data from this review uh, showing particularly a relative risk reduction in females uh, as seen on the left side of this diagram. So uh, endometrial cancer, just to refer to a couple of the well-known uh, obesity-related cancers. So bariatric surgery is associated with a 71% risk reduction for uterine cancer. Uh, and uh, here is a look at adenocarcinomas of the esophagus, where there's a, a relationship with body mass index. This is the incidence of, of esophageal carcinoma related to body mass index in males and females. And then a, a meta-analysis looking at colorectal cancer uh, incidence, which was significantly lower uh, versus non-operated obese individuals, the relative risk of 0.73% with a 27% lower risk of colorectal cancer in the bariatric surgery arm and liver cancer uh, 61 percent lower prevalence of liver cancer compared to those patients who had no history of bariatric surgery um, and uh, very significant. Um, so now we'll turn briefly to quality and patient safety which has been a major focus of work for the bariatric surgery specialty in recent years and I will uh, introduce you to this graph which you may or may not have seen looking at mortality uh, this is University Hospital Consortium data going back to 2002 uh, to 2009. This was a period of dramatic reduction in risk for bariatric surgery, uh, going from 4% to one half of 1% over the course of a few years. This is uh, uh, Medicare data looking at the same issue, mortality. The dividing line here is the 2006 um, national coverage decision. And uh, you can see a general decrease over the same general period of time in, in mortality. And in fact, if you try to superimpose these two uh, lines, you'll see something that we commonly see is that the Medicare population is, is well represented by some of our other cohorts of data. The red dots here are the Medicare outcomes on mortality. The red line is the NCD uh, time period in 2006. So you see these things line up. It's an overall reduction in significant risk of complications over the course of time. Uh, and uh, here's uh, some more uh, Medicare data looking at 2010 uh, gastric bypass specifically where the mortality was 0.2 percent and this fair, uh, compares favorably with various other commonly done uh, procedures including most notably cholecystectomy having a higher 
uh, mortality than gastric bypass surgery in the United States. Um, we have this study looking at the elderly, which is a Medicare el eligible population. Uh, typically, studies of the elderly patient reveal a higher rate of comorbidity in the older patient population undergoing bariatric surgery. And for example, you can see a twofold increase on the left hand graph in the incidence of diabetes at nearly 50% in the elderly group. Uh, but pretty safe surgery overall on the right, uh, the serious morbidity rate 1.3 and the in-hospital mortality 0.11% in the elderly patient group. So pretty acceptable outcome. So there's probably a lot of reasons why this has happened, including a shift to less invasive surgery over the course of time in our country. Uh, but all these issues uh, are true. Improved patient optimization, uh, taking, uh, taking care to do good patient selection, having multidisciplinary teams. But the underpinning of all this from our perspective is the process of accreditation. So there are now 845 centers that participate in our national accreditation program in bariatric surgery. They represent 49 of the 50 states. Uh, and uh, we do site visits to uh, authenticate the data. The data is collected by trained uh, registrars. Uh, here's some of the data. Uh, this is calendar year 2016. The mortality rate for 783 states in 186,000, just about cases, 0.11%. So very, very safe. And this is real world data, this is national data in the United States. And this is particularly relevant to our discussion today in the Medicare eligible population where we've divided by procedure and we've divided by age uh, greater than equal to 65. And just to hit some of the highlights here, even with gastric bypass that is a more complex surgical procedure in the age over 65 patient population, this is 2016 calendar year, um, 0.3 percent. So very acceptable. Remember the benchmark of cholecystectomy mortality, 0.9 percent. Uh, very safe surgery, one of the safest surgical procedures you can have done. So um, I'm going to skip through this very quickly because my time is, is running short, but uh, we have reviewed the issue of accreditation uh, in a number of studies and uh, also a meta-analysis looking at outcomes, uh, we see unaccredited centers have higher complication rates, higher mortality rates, and unaccredited status is a positive predictor of complications in our review of data. So here's 13 studies. Basically, <coughs> only two studies suggest there's no difference in outcomes between, between accredited and non-accredited centers. So we strongly support the idea of participation in the accreditation program to improve uh, the outcomes of bariatric surgery. And other major payers in the United States uh, do require this as part of their approach to approval for bariatric surgery. Now, one of the more exciting things that we've done now with this uh, quality program with accreditation is to actually begin national studies uh, to try and impact outcomes. And uh, the first project completed was the DROP project, decreasing re readmissions through opportunities with MBS AQIP. And uh, we piloted uh, in five centers and then applied the concepts of reducing readmission to 128 representative hospitals. And I'll show you some of the da data here. Um, what we most notably saw was a significant decrease in the post-sleeve gastrectomy readmission rate. In the last quarter of the study, it was down 27%. And you can see that on the right-hand graph uh, in the quart quarters of the study, one through four, uh, there was a little bit of a, of a rolling effect where it took some time to actually begin to impact practices, but again, uh, sleeve gastrectomy, a fairly significant decline in readmission rate over the course of this approach. 
And during this period of time, there was no change in morbidity of any of the procedures, uh, but just the decrease in readmission. We found that enacting a discharge phone call and a post-op visit with the surgeon and the nutritionist were the most important thing to decrease readmissions. So I'm going to touch now briefly on some of these newer FDA-approved interventions. I'm going to uh, focus this part of my talk on the intragastric balloon, but uh, there is information here on the V-block and the Aspire Assist, and I know we have speakers later that are going to cover these in, in more detail, but uh, we are in a situation where we have this device that has been around before, uh, and actually CMS has a, an exclusion to the concept of intragastric balloon treatment uh, where this device is placed in the stomach endoscopically. Uh, newer devices will not require endoscopic placement, uh, but there are some data to suggest the benefit of this, at least in a short-term uh, outcome uh, perspective. 82 publications on the Orbera device with nearly 7,000 patients, total body weight loss at six months, 13%, and some degree of maintenance of that weight loss. The balloon is removed at six months, but some persistence of the weight loss effect beyond the six-month period. And uh, I know for sure the gastroenterologists are going to talk about this to some extent, but here's a meta-analysis of the various studies, uh, which average 25% uh, excess weight loss with the device. Uh, and I mentioned before that one of the appeals of the intragastric balloon is the safety profile, which is very significant uh, compared to uh, more invasive surgical procedures in terms of uh, outcomes. Um, so uh, meta-analysis data available to talk about. I'm going to skip the Aspire Assist for now. It is an FDA-approved uh, method uh, for weight loss. And I'm going to wrap up now with uh, some of the barrier to care information uh, that we have. And uh, here's a look at the number of surgical procedures we estimate to occur annually in the United States uh, and uh, the various procedures. We estimate that there are nearly 16 million individuals that qualify for bariatric surgery based on the traditional uh, uh, qualifications that we have in our field. The penetration rate for surgical treatment, however, remains at about the 1% level. So uh, we are not treating uh, the epidemic of ob obesity very well with surgical approaches. So uh, to try and gain some information into why this may be, we uh, supported a, a national poll uh, and called Americans to ask them about their attitudes towards obesity and treatment options. Uh, so obesity and cancer were tied as the top biggest concerns for patients. Uh, patients did not identify themselves appropriately on average in terms of being candidates for surgery. They did not consider themselves obese even though their self-reported statistics would put them in the obese group. And uh, the American public believe that losing weight on one's own through diet and exercise is the way to do it. Uh, surgical treatment was way down on the list. And uh, this disturbing statistic, this was the percent of Americans who were surgically eligible, eligible whose doctor suggested surgery, only 12%. So I think you could argue that we are, to some degree, failing our patient population by not giving good discussion of treatment options. Um, so I think with our physician colleagues, we have perhaps knowledge issues, what's going on in bariatric surgery, the, the very safe nature of the procedure, their awareness of these facts, uh, their behavior, whether they really, in today's economic challenged world, do they have time to have these discussions with patients, and what are their priorities. But uh, we have enacted a, what we call the Obesity Collaborative Care Summit, where we uh, try to work with other societies and uh, develop um, uh, their knowledge of bariatric surgery treatments and other obesity treatments. So in conclusion, I hope I've convinced you in this whirlwind tour that bariatric surgery is safe. 
I hope I've convinced you that bariatric surgery is effective. It actually improves survival. Uh, there are procedures routinely covered by health insurance that have no survival benefits, such as joint replacement surgery. There isn't a payer in the United States that denies joint replacement surgery, and they can't even claim a survival benefit. We improve health with bariatric surgery, and we improve quality of life. Yet only 1% of eligible people are treated on an annual basis in the United States. And you could argue that, uh, that our 1% penetration of the population suggests that we're some, to some degree irrelevant at the current time in the treatment of the obesity <laughs> epidemic. And I would certainly like to see that change in the future. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present. Thank you, Dr. Mary. <laughs> Our next presenter is from Brown University. Uh, you'll have to help me out with the last name. Yes, I, I can help you pronounce that. <laughs> uh, hello, my name is Tom Trekalinos. I am from Brown. And uh, together with my uh, colleague, Orestes Panagiotou, I'm going to present the AHRQ-funded technology assessment. We have nothing to disclose. Obesity is uh, uh, prevalent in the Medicare population, and it's prevalent to such an extent that a substantial number of Medicare beneficiaries meet the NIH criteria for bariatric therapy. To be specific, when we refer to Medicare population in this technology assessment, we refer to people who are age 65 or older, or younger than 65, but have a disability or end-stage renal disease. The technology assessment is based on a systematic review of the evidence, and the idea is to describe the evidence base that is pertinent to Medicare-eligible patients who undergo bariatric surgery, bariatric therapy. It is guided by five key questions that I am going to review briefly now. The first key question has to do with mechanisms, pathophysiologic mechanisms by which the bariatric procedures act, and we are not going to talk about it. Dr. Di Maria summarized some of them. The second key question is about developing an evidence map. An evidence map is a, is a general description of studies of patients who receive bariatric surgeries, bariatric therapy, and, are, and, and these studies are applicable to the Medicare population. And in this general description, we describe the characteristics of the patients, the interventions, and the outcomes that have been studied. The third key question has to do with outcomes related to weight loss. It has several parts. We are interested in the effectiveness of different bariatric procedures, we are interested in person and intervention level modifiers of the effects of bariatric procedures. We are also interested in the frequency and predictors of failing to achieve at least minimal weight loss. And we are interested in the effects of revisional bariatric therapies on weight outcomes. The fourth key question is analogous to the third, but pertains to non-weight outcomes. We are interested in comparative effectiveness and safety of bariatric therapies and also on effect modifiers of said effects. Finally, key question five has to do with whether the effects of bariatric therapies on non-weight loss outcomes are mainly direct or are mainly mediated by uh, weight loss. In every systematic review, we have to identify, we have to define how uh, we select studies. And we usually do that by specifying the population, intervention, comparators, outcomes, timings, and settings of the eligible studies. These are our eligibility criteria, and I am going to review them briefly. In terms of populations, because we are interested in the Medicare population, we have limited ourselves to studies where the mean age or median age is, a, is above 55 years, or 
to studies that have included patients with disabilities or patients with end-stage renal disease. We exclude pediatric populations and pregnant women. We focus on studies that have a mean or median age uh, above 55 years because generally studies in, exclu in patients who are exclusively above 65 are rare and because uh, majority of the patients who receive Medicare, who, who receive bariatric therapies and are Medicare eligible do so for reasons of, um, of, uh, of uh, disability, are, are patients who are in Medicare because of disability. In terms of interventions, we consider bariatric therapy to be any procedure that results in an anatomic or a functional change of the gastrointestinal system, whether or not a device is placed. These procedures, these therapies, may be done uh, with surgery, either open or through laparoscopy, or they may be done endoscopically. We are interested in comparing bariatric procedures with other bariatric procedures or with pharmacological, behavioral, and nutritional treatments or with no treatment or sham treatment. In terms of outcomes, the technology assessment is interested in all clinical outcomes, but for the purposes of this meeting, of interest is weight loss, post-operative complications, and metabolic, cardiovascular, respiratory, and musculoskeletal outcomes, and quality of life. We are interested in studies that are uh, pertinent to, to the current setting, so we included studies that have been conducted after the 2000s. We are including studies that have been done in research settings, such as randomized trials, and also studies that, that use real-world evidence or have been done with routinely collected data. We are interested in estimating causal effects, causal treatment effects. And for these types of uh, estimations, the randomized trial is the gold standard. This is because randomization ensures that in expectation, the compared groups are similar in the distribution of effect modifiers that have been measured or unmeasured. Therefore, any difference in the outcome can be ascribed to the difference in the treatment. However, we are also reviewing non-randomized studies. The issue here is that on average, the compared groups are likely to differ in the distribution of effect modifiers, and these differences uh, have to be accounted for. If these differences are not accounted for in analysis or design, we are going to have biased estimates of treatment effects. To operationalize what studies are admissible to get information for causal treatment effects, we have these following two criteria. So a study is admissible if it has an explicitly comparative scope and if the study has taken at least some minimal effort to balance confounders and other prognostic factors between the compared groups. This minimal effort could have been done via design. In the optimal case, it is a randomized trial. If it's not randomized, it's through matching or in analysis, for example, with statistical model. We do not use non-comparative studies to make inferences or estimates about causal treatment effects, but we, because the evidence is relatively sparse in the Medicare-eligible population, we do uh, report results from non-comparative studies uh, for descriptive purposes. We are interested in studies of predictive models and uh, to describe their eligibility, we first define what we mean by predictive models. So we are very generous and we say that we take as predictive model anything, any function that maps variables, input variables at baseline, which are the predictors to the outcomes, which are the outputs. Eligible study designs are we want cohort studies. We want studies that fully report the predictive models for success or failure of bariatric surgery with respect to weight loss. And also we demand that predictors are measured at baseline. We have excluded all studies that uh, do not focus on prediction but focus on associations. We searched broadly. We searched over 10 sources, including uh, bibliographic databases, uh, registries of studies and scientific information packages. 
and we have rated the strength of the evidence of the associated evidence base for specific conclusion statements. We do that by evaluating four domains, the risk of bias, the consistency, precision, directness, and applicability of the evidence that is accompanying the specific statement, the specific conclusion statement. Briefly speaking, the strength of evidence is, is graded into rates, grades of high, moderate, or low, depending on how confident we are that the evidence base gives an effect that is close to the true effect. There is also a rating of, his, of insufficient if there is no uh, evidence that supports a specific uh, conclusion. And I think that here I will uh, turn it to Orestes to go on and describe the actual results. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Orestes Panagiotou. I'm also from uh, the Brown EPC Center. Uh, I have no conflicts of interest, and uh, I will pick up where Tom left by describing the results of uh, the actual results of uh, our systematic review and technology assessment. So, by applying the criteria and the search strategies that uh, uh, Dr. Tricalinos uh, described, uh, we came up with an evidence base of almost 10,000 uh, citations. Uh, which at the end of the day, after applying our inclusion and exclusion criteria, uh, gave us an eligible sample of 94 studies. Of those, 70 were uh, uh, cohort observ uh, observational studies uh, that uh, uh, were either comparative in nature or non-comparative, and uh, another 24 studies that gave us uh, evidence of uh, prediction studies and uh, predictive models and uh, 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 weight loss after bariatric surgery uh, based on uh, uh, different predictors. So uh, this slide describes very uh, uh, from, a, uh, from, from, from a, a few uh, thousand feet what, how, how the evidence looked like, the evidence based. Uh, we did not identify any randomized studies uh, in the Medicare population that compared bariatric surgeries or bariatric procedures. Um, and uh, among the 70 uh, studies, non-randomized studies that I described before, uh, 13 uh, were comparative uh, they, or admissible by our definition based on modeling or uh, design. And the majority were, uh, 70, uh, 57 of them uh, were non-comparative in nature, which means that they did not, they did not take any, any, uh, any effort, any approach to minimize uh, bias. And these, the majority of them, uh, as I will describe later, are studies that report effects in a pre versus post uh, design. Uh, of interest is also that we did not identify any studies in the medical population that uh, uh, pertain to endoscopic proce procedures. So all the results that we're going to discuss today are about uh, surgical interventions. And the majority of the studies that we identified as uh, eligible were published after 2010, which actually means that our uh, uh, timing uh, criterion to include studies after 2000 uh, did not skew the results at all. Of the 70 studies uh, that we had, of the 70 observational studies, uh, seven were studies that used directly data from uh, Medicare beneficiaries. Uh, these are different types of claims data that Medicare makes available. And of the remaining uh, 60, uh, 63 studies, uh, three uh, were in uh, uh, patients uh, who had end-stage renal uh, disease, three were in patients who had some type of disability as this was described by the investigators, and the majority were on patients who met the age criterion that we said uh, that is 55 years old uh, or older. This table uh, shows how, uh, what type of, what type of uh, bariatric surgeries were identified in the Medicare population, how these studies are uh, performed, uh, whether they're open or laparoscopic, um, and then different numbers about the, the cohorts that have been studied. So we identified studies on adjustable gastric banding, mini gastric bypass, uh, Ruen Y gastric bypass, single anastomosis with uh, duodenal switch, sleeve gastrectomy, vertical band gastroplasty, and uh, biliopancreatic diversion with uh, duodenal switch. And as you can see, the majority of them uh, were conducted uh, laparoscopically given that the, our studies were relatively new. 
the next table shows how these uh, uh, procedures uh, are distributed in the literature based on different types of uh, adverse or uh, of outcome categories. So we saw here uh, adverse events, adverse events, weight and uh, BMI related outcomes and uh, other health outcomes based on the different interventions and the different ways that these interventions were performed. Again, you can see that most of them uh, pertain to laparoscopically performed surgeries. Uh, this is uh, a graph that uh, we created in order to try to show, to uh, generate the, the evidence map, so a visualization of the evidence map. On uh, the vertical axis, uh, we saw the different types of interventions or bariatric procedures that we identified, and uh, the vertical axis shows weight loss outcomes and how they were defined in the literature. Each cell uh, shows uh, circles that represent one cohort uh, of patients who received their respective procedures and had their uh, respective outcome measured. And the number on the, uh, on the uh, uh, corner here shows the, the actual number of cohorts. So you can see that uh, for some interventions like mini gastric bypass, there is probably uh, very sparse evidence. Only one cohort of patients who had received this uh, intervention and have measured the outcome of uh, percent excess weight loss. While on the other side, uh, there, is, uh, there are many studies about, or many cohorts of patients who have received Y gastric bypass and have measured, and on those patients, many different weight loss outcomes have been measured. The next slide uh, is similar in concept, but here instead of showing weight loss outcomes, uh, we're showing different types of uh, post-operative complications that take place uh, within 90 days after surgery. And uh, we can see that for some specific outcomes or uh, outcomes that are particularly important in patients that receive surgery like thromboembolism or uh, acute pancreatitis, there is the, these outcomes are not very often reported uh, in the literature. So this type of graph, like also the one that I have, we have included later about uh, other health outcomes, can give us a very good idea of how the evidence base looks like and can help us quickly identify where the evidence, uh, ex the evidence gap exists in regards to interventions and outcomes. So we'll uh, switch now to our uh, third key question, which was about uh, uh, describing the effects of interventions on weight loss outcomes. And I will start with comparative studies that try to address this question. We actually identified only three such studies that compared either one why versus sleeve, gastre uh, sleeve gastrectomy or uh, laparoscopic adjustable gastric banding, or sleeve gastrectomy versus laparoscopic adjustable gastric banding. We also identified uh, a fourth study that I will describe first, uh, which compared uh, laparoscopic sleeve gastrectomy against conventional medical treatment. So this last study included two groups of patients. Uh, uh, each of them was, uh, had 30 participants. And uh, it showed that on, uh, on average, the laparoscopic sleeve gastrectomy was associated with statistically significant improvements in regards both to BMI and uh, body weight outcomes. This is a, a, third this is a, a separate study that compared uh, detailed pairwise comparisons between uh, par laparoscopic adjustable uh, gastric banding, ruin y gastric bypass, and uh, sleeve gastrectomy in three different cohorts of patients. And you can see that uh, at six months, each graph shows uh, the percent, the values of the outcome for excess percent weight loss, percent total body weight loss, BMI reduction, and uh, weight loss in these patients. And you can see that for all three outcomes, uh, ruin y gastric bypass always uh, outperforms both uh, sleeve gastrectomy, which is the, red, uh, the, the green bar, and uh, LHGB. And the same patterns, seem to exist in 12 months, where again, laparoscopic uh, ruin y gastric bypass seems to achieve better outcomes in terms of weight loss and BMI loss, both for, uh, compared to both LHGB and uh, uh, sleeve gastrectomy. This graph actually puts together the two previous graphs, and uh, we saw uh, visually how the results look like at six and uh, two months. And the main finding from this graph is that there is a sustained effect for all three bariatric surgeries at six, and, uh, uh, at six and 12 months. And if anything, the effect seems to actually uh, be higher uh, from six to two months, to 12 months. 
So the second type of studies that were identified in regards to, effect, to weight loss outcomes were non-comparative studies, and this is what actually constitutes the majority of the evidence base. And as I mentioned before, these are studies that describe uh, changes in the outcomes before versus after bariatric surgery. And the main limitation of those studies is that uh, they do not have a control group, so they, would not allow, they do not allow us to make formal comparisons between different interventions. This is a, a little bit of a busy slide, so I'll spend uh, a few minutes to try to describe it. What we, we saw here are different uh, data points, each of them representing uh, the value of the outcome before versus after bariatric surgery for percent excess BMI loss, percent excess weight loss, uh, percent total body weight loss, BMI loss as an absolute uh, outcome, and weight loss. And we have, present, we have done this for three different types of interventions. Uh, gastric banding, which are the blue, the blue circles, uh, ruin white gastric bypass, which is, which is the red uh, triangles, and sleeve gastrectomy, which are the green uh, uh, crosses. So this graph shows that for all those three procedures, there seem to be an effect uh, on different weight loss outcomes, which is highly variable, and the distribution is quite uh, substantial uh, across these three procedures. But I would like to draw your attention here to avoid making any comparisons between interventions, which one may be achieving better outcomes because these are different cohorts of patients and these interventions are not directly compared to each other. So this is more of a descriptive approach to see how effects uh, of these procedures are distributed in uh, Medicare patients. The, the, the next type of intervention that we identified evidence on, or very limited evidence on, actually was mini gastric bypass, where we had one study that gave us a very uh, representative graph of uh, how uh, weight loss changes uh, over time. So you can see here that patients who received uh, mini gastric bypass uh, had increased w uh, excess weight loss uh, at the first year, and this effect, uh, this weight loss actually sustained, was sustainable up to five years after surgery. Of course, there's a limitation here that uh, among all those people who received bariatric surgery, who received mini gastric bypass, 95% were followed up at one month, but only 72% of them had data available at five months. So there's some uh, attrition going on over time. Uh, a similar graph uh, is shown here for single anastomosis duodenal switch, where we saw how uh, excess BMI loss and excess, uh, percent excess weight loss change over time for uh, uh, patients who received duodenal switch. And you can see again that uh, from uh, baseline up to, to 18 months, uh, the effect of these interventions seems to increase. This table is uh, uh, something that we have in our uh, technology assessment, and I'm not going to go through uh, details of each, uh, uh, each cell here, but I would like to draw your attention at the last column, which shows the overall strength of evidence for different procedures and different outcomes. So based on the evidence that we found and the fact that most of the studies are uh, non-comparative studies and non-randomized uh, uh, studies, we have a uh, low to uh, moderate strength of evidence that different bariatric surgeries uh, compared favorable to each other in regards to weight loss outcomes. The next key question that we addressed was about uh, the effect of bariatric surgery, different procedures on uh, non-weight outcomes. And here we identified uh, 27 studies that actually tried to compare bariatric procedures to each other or other interventions. But only 12 of those were admissible based on the criteria that uh, Dr. Tricalinos described in regards to giving us uh, unbiased estimates of treatment effects. So uh, the big picture here is that most studies, as I will show later, present or uh, provide uh, statistically significant changes when it comes to intermediate endpoints or what we call soft outcomes, uh, like lipids or uh, metabolism biomarkers. But very few studies actually show that uh, there is uh, effect on hard outcomes like diabetes or cardiovascular disease. This is an example. Uh, uh, this is a forest plot without doing the, the pulling across uh, different studies that shows how bariatric surgery uh, compares to different types of bariatric surgery compared to either no surgery or orthopedic surgery in regards to uh, mortality. And uh, uh, you can see that uh, for 
some of these, inter some of these studies, there seems to be uh, an effect when it comes to uh, uh, mortality, but for uh, some of them, when it comes to cause-specific mortality like cardiovascular or cancer mortality, the effects uh, seem to be non statistically significant. Uh, the, next, uh, the next figure shows uh, the results of one study that uh, provided uh, compared different types of bariatric surgeries uh, versus control. Here we could not uh, identify specific procedures that uh, patients uh, had received. So there is a lump or a, um, a group that, a composite group that received any bariatric surgery. And you can see that compared to either gastrointestinal or orthopedic surgery, these pa uh, patients who received bariatric uh, procedures are doing better in terms of myocardial infraction and the composite endpoint but there seems to be hardly an effect when it comes to stroke. Uh, this is a similar sli slide that compares uh, uh, ruined Y versus sleep gastrectomy in regards to post-operative complications within zero to 90 days after surgery. And uh, the reassuring thing here as previous, uh, the previous presenter described is that uh, all the effects are very close, are very close to the null, to the, uh, to the new line of uh, no effect. So this practically means that bariatric surgery is not associated with any uh, statistically significant complications. The next uh, outcome that I'm going to present uh, some evidence on is uh, diabetes and metabolic outcomes where we identified 40 study, uh, four studies. Uh, one, the first one of, of them is the, the uh, same as before uh, where uh, sleep gastrectomy was compared to conventional weight loss treatment. And there seems to be uh, a favorable profile of low, um, laparoscopic sleeve gastrectomy compared to medical treatment when it comes to uh, lipids, triglycerides, and uh, glycated hemoglobin. However, there uh, seems to be uh, no effect on uh, LDL cholesterol uh, in these patients. Uh, another study looked at uh, successful C's uh, of insulin in uh, type 2 diabetic patients who undergo uh, ruin Y versus uh, laparoscopic adjustable gastric uh, bending. And both for this outcome and for the outcome of clinical remission of type 2 diabetes, ruin Y uh, gastric bypass always does better compared to LHGB, to laparoscopic adjustable gastric bending. However, in uh, a separate study that compared bariatric surgery versus no surgery at all, uh, there was no evidence that type 2 diabetes imp improved. Uh, this is the similar graph from uh, the study that I identified before where uh, laparoscopic adjustable gastric binding, ruin y gastric bypass, and sleeve gastrectomy were compared to each other. Uh, now this is in regards to uh, glucose level, HDL, uh, glycated hemoglobin, LDL, triglycerides, and total cholesterol. And at six months, as well as 12 months after surgery, there seems to be no statistically significant difference between these three procedures. Uh, one study compared uh, our reported uh, um, evidence in regards to polypharmacy, how many different drugs people receive and whether there's a reduction after bariatric surgery. Uh, so there seems to be uh, a greater reduction in the number of medications that people use after uh, ruin y gastric bypass compared to sleeve gastrectomy or gastric bending, but uh, sleeve gastrectomy and LHB gastric bending do not perform differently to each other. However, uh, this effect was uh, also, this type of uh, effect was also uh, observable at 18 months, uh, where the number of, uh, the mean number of medications, uh, of antihypertensive medications was reduced, was reduced from 1.5 to uh, 0.83 pills per day. Uh, the next outcome that we uh, are presenting here today is a respiratory outcome, and unfortunately for this, we identified only uh, one study which uh, uh, showed that there is some improvement in sleep apnea with bariatric surgery at six months, but there is uh, no longer, uh, no, no long-term effect at one or two years. When it comes to uh, musculoskeletal outcomes, we only identified one study uh, that actually did not take um, had some issues with residual confounding in regards to the variables that they included in their analysis, but we're showing here the results as an indication that uh, ruin y versus uh, control, in, uh, control interventions in postmenopausal women seem to have no difference in 
uh, regards to uh, TSH, alkaline phosphatase, and other biomarkers of uh, bone metabolism. Unfortunately, we, uh, a topic that is very relevant in this population uh, of Medicare beneficiaries, uh, there is no evidence about, no studies at all, that provide comparative evidence about health-related quality uh, of life outcomes. Uh, there seems, uh, there are some studies that report changes in different uh, scales that measure quality of life before versus after bariatric surgery, uh, but it is uh, evident that there is a uh, lot of heterogeneity in how these outcomes are measured, and the two most common scales that were identified were SF36 and the disability rating index. So for uh, most outcomes that uh, are of interest to uh, the Medicare population and we try to identify the evidence on, we actually found uh, very, or, uh, uh, very limited or uh, no evidence at all when it comes to quality of life, cancer, nutritional deficiencies, renal function, and other uh, patient-relevant outcomes. Uh, again, a very a, a busy uh, table here that tries to summarize the strength of evidence in regards to the effects of bariatric surgeries uh, on uh, non-weight loss outcomes. And as was the case with uh, uh, weight loss outcomes, again, for most of these comparisons and outcomes, the overall strength of evidence seems to be low or moderate. The, the final topic uh, that I'm going to discuss pertains to uh, prediction models uh, to, for us to predict uh, outcomes of bariatric surgery in uh, um, patients that uh, meet the Medicare criteria. So one thing that we try to identify here were models that explicitly uh, define an outcome of minimal weight loss, but actually there was no such study that uh, gave uh, an explicit definition of that, and instead there were different types of uh, threshold that uh, investigators used in regards to how they define success or failure of bariatric surgery. Uh, the most interesting thing from uh, our appraisal of the different prediction models that uh, exist in the literature right now is that none of these models uh, were internally validated or even more importantly externally validated. And these uh, two procedures or two processes, statistical processes, are very important when we evaluate a statistical model for prediction because uh, if the model is internally or even better externally validated, the, it is more easy or we're more confident that it can be generalized in populations other than those where the study was conducted. Here is a, a table that tries to summarize the different predictors that have been included in the 40 models that we uh, identified. Uh, I will not describe one, uh, one by one, but we have a detailed explanation and effect sizes for, different, for these different predictors in our uh, report and technology assessment. Uh, but I would say that most of the most, some of the most commonly uh, predictors that are being included in models are age, gender, uh, and diabetic medications, and also some of them included the specific type of bariatric surgery that patients received. So summarizing what we found uh, in regards to the evidence base of bariatric surgery in the Medicare population, we did not find any studies on uh, endoscopic procedures. Uh, we found no randomized evidence for uh, surgically performed bariatric interventions. And we very, most importantly, we found very few non-randomized uh, non comparative studies because the majority of uh, the studies were uh, pre-post studies that did not have any comparator group. So the strength of evidence, as I described, both for uh, weight outcomes and uh, non-weight rela non related outcomes, uh, is low to, med to moderate. And uh, the main uh, concern that we had here in order for us to assign this uh, strength of evidence was that there's, there is unmeasured confounding that uh, previous studies do not fully take into account. Based on whatever information we can infer from uh, 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 pre versus post uh, intervention, uh, pre versus post studies, we can say that there seems to be a sustained effect on uh, bariat of bariatric surgery in the medical population. But again, uh, we are not making full assertions that this is uh, a causal treatment effect. Uh, as uh, previous, as Dr. Di Maria mentioned, uh, there seems to be extensive evidence that uh, um, 
bariatric surgery improves outcomes in younger populations, but for us to make uh, formal uh, statistical inferences about how this evidence uh, translates into the medically eligible population, this was something that goes beyond the scope of uh, this report, and uh, that's why all our inferences are primarily based on uh, patients above 55 years. So we also try to identify what evidence, what gaps exist in the evidence uh, based, uh, based on the extensive search that we did. So the major gap that we see is that there are practically no randomized uh, studies that uh, can give us unbiased estimates of treatment causal effects. Uh, there's also not many well-designed or well-executed uh, non-randomized studies that could allow us to make inferences about uh, treatment effects. And when it comes to prediction models, there's also uh, a lack of uh, validated models that we can uh, reliably use in clinical practice. Also, there is no lack uh, in regards to mediation analysis, which would allow us to tell what effect of uh, bariatric surgery is direct on non-weight loss outcomes and what may be uh, mediated or be ind indirect through its effect on weight loss outcomes. What could be done given these uh, uh, considerations? So we believe that uh, there is now uh, a wealth of routinely collected health data. Many of them uh, were presented earlier, and I believe there are other presenters who are discussing these data in uh, uh, detail. So it is now possible to design non-randomized uh, comparative studies using routinely collected health data in ways that try to imitate a randomized trial. And there are also methods that try to calibrate what treatment effects we see from younger patients uh, in RCTs to a target population by combining different study designs. And of course, these, mod these uh, types of data can be used for us to validate, or for the community, to validate uh, models that can allow us to predict outcomes of bariatric surgery. Some uh, examples for this type of uh, data sources include Medicare claims, uh, which are actually directly applicable to Medicare uh, patients, the Medicare population, electronic health records, and different registries as the uh, MBSA equip. And with that, I would like to thank our team and two of the members that are in uh, the audience today. Thank you very much. Our next presenter is Joe Natglowski, President and CEO of Obesity Action Coalition. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, my name is Joe Naglowski. I'm President and CEO of the Obesity Action Coalition, which is a 501c3 nonprofit organization made up primarily of people with obesity. We have about 60,000 members and 90% of them have self-identified themselves as having obesity. The other 10% or though are, are healthcare professionals and we do have a few uh, corporate members as well. So I'll add that as part of my uh, disclosure side here. Um, served on lots of other activities related to um, uh, bariatric surgery that I wanted to disclose. I've been part of the data access committees for both the, the uh, old Surgical Review Corporation's database, the BOLD database, as well as a member of the Data Access Committee as the patient representative for ASMBS. Uh, you can hear about some PCORI work next, and I'm uh, actively involved in those projects, including sitting on the board of one of the uh, uh, data registries, and I've participated in all kinds of other panels uh, that, are, that are listed here, just as full disclosure. Um, I am also a reviewer on the uh, document that was, or the data that was just presented as well. Um, I will say for all those projects, I list them as minor, but I receive no personal compensation. I have no financial ties to industry. All those monies, if any are involved, go to OAC and not to me personally. So I'm supposed to give you the patient view of, of this conversation today. So I'm going to take it in a little bit of a different direction, though we'll hit a couple of the points that uh, folks have uh, brought up already. So I think, uh, and this paper has been referenced already, but I think it's very important that we understand that obesity is a chronic disease and we have a limited understanding of its pathogenesis. I think there is this bias in society that people think that we know what causes obesity. People eat less and, or eat more and exercise less than they should. But it is much more complicated than that. And for any of you who haven't read it, it is worth reading the endocrine paper. I know Dr. DiMaria mentioned that as well. 
And obesity is awfully widespread. And I think one of the things that gets lost in this, um, and oftentimes is criticizing some of the bariatric surgery studies, is that, wow, they're, they're, they're all women in these studies, right? Where are the men? But the reality is the data shows us that actually <laughs> twice as many women have severe obesity as men. And so therefore, that is the population who struggles uh, with, with obesity and are most likely to use these procedures. So just a couple of things for your consideration from my perspective is, you know, people with obesity vary, as do their responses to obesity interventions. And I'm gonna make a bold statement here when I say we don't have one therapy that works for everyone. And so I know we engage in these efforts where we try to compare therapies, but I will tell you, I don't think we're there yet, right? Because we don't have a therapy, we don't have a standard therapy that if we give it to someone, we know it's going to work. The reality is we have varying responses to these therapies. And the, frankly, success looks very different from a patient perspective. You know, some people, weight loss is important, but others, it's comorbidity resolution or quality of life improvements or functional status. And so I think as we challenge and we look forward at this data today, I know quality of life made the bottom of the list there, but I think we should add other of those items too that actually really look at the patient experience. You know, many of us who struggle with obesity, myself included, um, uh, what's important to us is not the pounds on the scale. And some of us, it's not actually the comorbidity resolution. It really is how we can function in our life. And I think that's important to understand. And I will tell you, I think our biggest problem is, is that we treat obesity as an acute illness and not a chronic disease. The, the reality is, is that, you know, we're here today evaluating bariatric surgery outcomes, right? But bariatric surgery is only one small part of the continuum of care for obesity. Once you have obesity, you always have obesity. And yes, I can see a dietitian, or I can use medication, or I can have bariatric surgery, but your obesity does not go away after that, right? This is something you struggle with for the rest of your life. And, and I think comprehensive care is not the norm. And so we have to be careful as we pigeonhole these procedures into looking at them as a one-off instead of a comprehensive treatment model. Of course, I realize that requires us to break the system, right? That's how we, we pay for procedures these days, but it is a real challenge. The other aspect of uh, living with obesity um, is the societal stigma associated with it. And for those of you who know me know I speak about two topics. I speak about access to care and I most often speak about weight bias. And really this is the attitudes people have towards people with obesity. If, if you've never experienced living with obesity, I would ask you to find someone who does and actually have a conversation with them about what their life is like. The reality is the social burden that society puts on people is horrendous. And people internalize that shame and blame and it makes it even worse. And the reality is we know that people who are victims of stigma actually eat more, so therefore they gain weight. So this idea that I'm gonna motivate somebody by making fun of them because of their weight um, actually is not true. The data is very clear that it causes people to actually to gain weight. I think the other area of stigma that doesn't get talked about as much is the stigma of having bariatric surgery. The reality is, is when we look at studies, there is just as much of a stigma of needing help for your obesity as obesity itself. And the studies show that people who have had bariatric surgery do not see the same reductions in stigma that people who have lost weight through other means do. Primarily, that would be through diet and exercise, because I don't think we've studied the endoscopic devices or drug therapy in that, in that situation. So I would challenge you as the committee today, realizing there's a stigma around bariatric surgery, realizing there's a stigma around obesity, that you don't let those attitudes influence your decision today. I would challenge you as you're reviewing a question to think in your mind to say, hey, what if we were talking about diabetes and it was a different procedure? Would I ask the same question or would I question the evidence in the same way? Because the reality is, is that what we see so far is that society has a very different attitude about bariatric surgery than what I think it should. Same challenge goes to the agency on how you use the data you come up with today. You know, the reality is, were the questions asked based on bias in the first place, or were they based in truly trying to understand science? That's a question only the agency itself can ask and answer. So what do we know about seniors and obesity? So I participate in a study called the Action Study, um, and we've uh, published a few abstracts. The primary paper's coming out here soon. But actually, we find that seniors with obesity actually have pretty similar views to the general public. This study 
actually asked 3,000 people with obesity, nine, or, and 900 plus 30 percent were seniors. And so they have matching views about obesity disease. You see our numbers a little bit different than uh, Dr. D. Maria's. We actually asked a follow-up question around this, is that, okay, 66 percent of seniors believe obesity is a disease, but what percentage think that obesity is all your own fault? And that number is in the 90s. So obviously there's a little bit of a translation of what a disease means versus blame. Um, they have significantly higher comorbidities. This is matches what uh, we saw from Dr. De Maria's uh, data. And we see that actually it's specific medical events that drive their desire for obesity care. We sometimes see this in the younger population, but it's definitely more evident in our seniors. Um, and then they have what I think is a good thing, which is the right goals, right? The goals around improving health, right? This, your quality of health and your quality of life. Uh, they seem to be uh, the, the more appropriate goals than we sometimes see with younger populations. Curiously, we also see that seniors were less likely to actually see their health care provider about obesity. And whether that directly impacts what we're working on today or, or impacts other coverage decisions that Medicare has with around counseling, it is, it is, this is important information. And they're also less likely to have a formal diagnosis of obesity, again. Probably more applicable to the screening and intensive counseling area, but it is important to know. And though, you know, seniors are similar to regular, uh, or they, those under age 65, um, there are some differences that I think we can learn from um, moving forward. Sorry, having a little trouble with the clicker. All right. So what are the realities of collecting data on bariatric surgery? I think we've heard a lot of what, what's there and what's not there so far, so I wanted to actually, as a patient advocate, tell you what I think the limitations are. So the first one is that only a handful of the RCTs we saw talked about today actually included the cost of these procedures. Um, most cases, the patient needs either their insurer, Medicare, or their own pocketbook to pay for these procedures. And bariatric surgery coverage is not universal. I would say um, you see it commonly covered in Medicare and Medicaid. You see it commonly covered for state employees, federal employees. If you work for a large company, it's likely covered. But only in 23 of 50 states is it considered essential under the Affordable Care Act, and so you see widespread coverage there. I will also say that the data that's going in uh, and that we're actually able to look at is biased in some way by the payers themselves because they limit who can have bariatric surgery. And sometimes these limits don't make any sense. And in fact, it's the most common call we receive at Obesity Action Coalition when a um, patient calls us and said, well, my payer is making me, the paying, who's ever paying for my insurance is making me do this or, or do that to be able to have bariatric surgery. And I pulled an example from the, the coverage database here is so, say we're talking about cardiovascular outcomes and we want to look at hypertension in the Medicare population. Well, one of your contractors says you have to be on one drug. The other one says you have to be, have resistant hypertension on three drugs to be able to have bariatric surgery. That inconsistency is going to create inconsistency in the data and therefore it may ultimately uh, not produce the right outcomes. And RCTs can be challenging as well. I won't repeat the first line because our friends at AHRQ uh, shared that already. But I will tell you that um, randomization is tough from a patient perspective, especially when it comes to obesity and severe obesity. I will tell you, most of us who struggle have been through dozens of programs before, and if you're going to randomize me to something that is not, you know, something that I've done before and unsuccessful, I'm not going to participate in your trial. There are very few patients who will be completely open to saying, I will accept any randomization you move me forward to. And so I think we, I understand that RCTs are the gold standard, but I think we need to be very, very careful with what we're doing. I also would tell you that there are many patients who are not open to a surgical or a device intervention. Okay? We talk to them every day, and there are other therapies available. Only counseling under Medicare, there are other therapies that are not covered by Medicare. That is a conversation for another day. Um, so I happen to participate in a lot of these large registries and database projects, and so I wanted to comment on those a little bit as well. You know, I think these, these databases have the, answer, the ability to answer the questions that you've asked. But I think there's some challenges with that. You know, it was just a couple years ago that Medicare decided they weren't going to require accreditation anymore. And so if we want the data, yet we don't require people to participate, to me there's a disconnect there. 
I will also say, you know, with MBSA QIP database, when the old bold, bold database existed, I was the most common requester of data out of that database. And I'll be honest with you, I didn't use it for research purposes. I used it for access and advocacy purposes. But with that being said, we don't have that same level of access to the MBSA QIP data. And this is a, uh, something that my friends at the ASMBS have heard me say many times. We haven't yet convinced the College of Surgeons to give us public access to that database to answer some of these important questions. Um, our friends from PCORI are up next, and they um, have this wonderful network that I think has the ability to answer some of the questions. You know, this, all this data they've collected across the country and the uh, clinical data research networks and the work that Do Dr. Arterburn is doing to actually study bariatric surgery through that data uh, is important, and I think it will help you with some of the questions moving forward. We're about six months too early. If we had this hearing six months later, you'd see some of that data. But with that being said, I do want to point out some challenges with that data. I will tell you that the clinical data research networks, because I sit on the board of one of them, is made up of the largest providers in the state. And oftentimes, the kind of places that perform bariatric surgery procedures, and especially these new endoscopic procedures, these surgical centers, are not part of those networks. So we have to understand that it may not give us all the data we want moving forward. So there isn't a perfect solution in my mind with the data. So I mentioned this earlier, and I think it's worth repeating, is that obesity care is provided as acute care and not chronic care. And I will tell you that, I think most of you know this, but when a payer pays for bariatric surgery or one of these endoscopic procedures, it's paying for the procedure. It's not paying for the post care or anything along those lines. And oftentimes that post care is not covered by insurance. Um, and many of them actually allow only one procedure per lifetime. And I would think about that again, that's thinking of obesity as an acute thing, and right, we have a perfect solution. We would never tell a cancer patient that they're only allowed one treatment per lifetime. You know, we, most of us would say we're gonna progress from the least invasive to the most invasive until we find the solution, right? But in obesity, we aren't there, and actually the data reflects that as you see some of these studies and you, and you see how we, we're being short-sighted in the way we allow people to have these procedures done. I will tell you, I think the thing that concerns me the most about bariatric surgery is the long-term follow-up. And I think there's a real opportunity to fix long-term follow-up by actually providing reimbursement for that care. I mean, people see dietitians, they see exercise physiologists, they go to support group, um, and they are required to take vitamins for the rest of their lives in many of these procedures. And, and the reality is, is that at times, these services aren't provided because Medicare and other agencies don't provide the reimbursement for it. You also see a wide problem when people move. Again, it was the initial act of surgery that ended up paying for the lifetime of care for this patient. Where are they gonna get this care right now? Oftentimes they're charged prohibitive fees to be able to be part of that, which aren't covered by their insurance. And then finally, a, a topic that's very important to me, I, I truly believe in the, the value of the support group system. And we have great evidence in the behavioral weight management programs that support groups provide great assistance to people moving forward, but again, in our current reimbursement system and our current accreditation system, there's little incentive to conduct these in bariatric practices. So what does this mean? I think really a reimbursement system discourages long-term care and easier data collection. I know I'm throwing out a, probably an impossible request with this, saying that we need to break the system and come up with a better system to reimburse these services. But I do think it really harms people. You see people, and I think uh, we didn't see the data in the studies, but I would imagine uh, issues around malnutrition and, and things like that long-term aren't being collected, and this is important data that we need to be able to uh, bring forward to people who are considering these procedures or have had them already. And I think it really does explain the low follow-up rate you see on many of these post-bariatric surgery studies. You know, and I will tell you that this has created the cottage industry. Many of these people come to me at OAC or to our organization at OAC looking for this information, and we try to provide it as best we can but it's also popped up all of this uh, information on the internet, which there are some studies of as well, showing how poor of quality, uh, some are high quality, some are very poor quality, where, where people are basically getting medical advice from their fellow patients, and that is something that, uh, you know, is a tragedy, in my opinion. All right, so let's talk about what I think are important to patients. I will, again, because there's a wide variety of patients, and they're very different, 
we don't have one thing that's important to everyone. But with that being said, I do think we have to move beyond weight loss and typical comorbidities towards quality of life, functional status, and patient reported outcomes. Um, I know it didn't make this, the AHRQ report because of timing, but I would encourage you to look at the Kalotkin piece that reviews uh, uh, quality of life, um, post-bariatric surgery out to 12 years data, and includes an atten and some uh, in-depth discussion on potential improvement of future studies in this area. And I think he's going to present a little bit in the, in the public comment section today, but I also think the ongoing PCORI lobster project, which is long-term outcomes of bariatric surgery techniques and their effect on related patient reported outcome measures studied by Dr. Hutter and his colleagues, should give us a greater collection of that patient reported outcomes data and the functional status data moving forward. Again, I would encourage the uh, MBSAQIP and the ACS to fully adopt that program and implement it as part of, of their accreditation process. So in conclusions, I'll just say that I think bias impacts people with obesity as well as people's perceptions about obesity treatments. Please, please don't let bias enter your conversations today. Obesity is a chronic disease and we don't have solutions for everyone yet. And that's why the work that is done here and the future work that's being done is so very, very important. But you have to acknowledge that responses and treatment goals vary between patients. I know you might say, well, we want a weight loss of X percent, but the average patient, that may not be their goal. They might want to be able to play with their grandchildren or get on an airplane or walk down the street without getting being made fun of. Um, I will say seniors' views, and again, this was their views, not the, their responses, um, generally match the public. Uh, when it comes to obesity. And I will tell you that data collection is hard, right? And so I think we're going to have to recognize that like, some of the data is missing, but the reality of why it's missing is going to requ require a concerted effort of all of us to be able to move it forward. And finally, I want to say patient-centered outcomes are important. And I think all of this uh, should be about putting patients first. And I know uh, that slide's been up a few times today, and I appreciate uh, the folks at CMS including that and doing that moving forward. Um, I will tell you that for many years I got invited to do these things and be the patient representative, um, but it's only been in the last couple years that I've seen the change where instead of being the token patient representative, now we're a valued participant in the process. So I want to thank everyone who's participated in that. Thank you very much. Okay, our next presenters are Dr. Marshauser and Dr. Otterburn, after which we will have a 10-minute break. Kim Marshauser. I'm a program officer at the, um, in the research infrastructure team at PCORI, the Patient Center Outcomes Research Institute. Um, and I have no other conflicts to disclose. So today I'm going to give a brief introduction to PCORI, as well as an overview of our investment in the development of PCORNet. And then I'm going to turn it over to our uh, PCORNet Bariatric Study PI, David Arterburn, to talk about this important observational study. So at PCORI, our mission is really to help people make informed healthcare decisions <clears throat> and improve healthcare delivery and outcomes by producing and promoting high integrity, evidence-based information that comes from research guided by patients, caregivers, and the broader healthcare community. So we have three important strategic goals to help us meet this mission. So we aim to increase the quantity, quality, and timeliness of useful, trustworthy research information available to support health decisions. We aim to speed the implementation and use of patient-centered outcomes research evidence, and we hope to influence the research funded by others to be more patient-centered. So at PCORI, we fund patient-centered outcomes research. So this is a relatively new form of comparative effectiveness research that considers patients' needs and preferences and the outcomes most important to them. It's research that investigates what works for whom and under what conditions, and ultimately it research, it's research that helps patients and other healthcare stakeholders make better informed decisions. So we fund research that is patient-centered and engages patients and other stakeholders. <coughs> so what do we mean by patient-centeredness? Well, this is research that aims to answer questions or examine outcomes that matter to patients within the context of patient preferences. It's research that reflects what is most important to patients and caregivers. 
And what we mean by patient and stakeholder engagement is that patients are partners in the research, not merely research subjects. This is active and meaningful engagement between scientists, researchers, and other stakeholders throughout all phases of the research process. So our national clinical research system is well intended but flawed and faces several challenges. So evidence generation is taking too long to support the needs of stakeholders. Research is becoming increasingly expensive, and ultimately research is not answering the questions that matter most to people. So PCORI saw these challenges as an opportunity to create PCORNet, which is the National Patient Center Clinical Research Network. This is a large, highly representative national network that enables large-scale clinical research to be conducted with enhanced quality and efficiency. So the mission of PCORNet is to enable people to make informed healthcare decisions by efficiently conducting clinical research relevant to their needs. So with PCORNet, we have a robust infrastructure that unites people, clinicians, and health system with data that is being generated every day from patients as they, as they have health encounters. PCORNet creates infrastructure and tools to support rapid clinical research and utilizes multiple data sources, including EHR, claims data, and data reported directly by people. So with PCORNet, we're trying to change the research conversation from one directed by researchers to one driven by the needs of patients and other healthcare stakeholders. So PCORNet embodies a network of networks that harnesses the power of partnerships. So there are two types of partner networks in PCORNet. There are patient-powered research networks, or PPRNs. So these are networks that are operated and governed by patients and their partners. So these networks are um, collecting patient-reported data, they are advocating for the research needs of their communities, and they're, they're driving uh, clinical research. So the second type of network is our clinical data research networks, or our CDRNs. So these are networks that originate in health systems, such as hospitals or health plans. So these networks are securely collecting health information during, during the routine course of care. And we have um, 13 clinical data research networks that serve millions of Americans across more than 100 health systems. But Cornet also has one coordinating center. So the coordinating center uh, leads the network's engagement and data activities. They work to partner with outside researchers, and they really support the network's infrastructure. So the Coordinating Center is a collaboration between PCORI, the Duke Clinical Research Institute, Genetic Alliance, and Harvard Program Healthcare Institute. And together, these make up the PCORNet network. So PCORNet is a community of research that unites data. And this data really is a collaboration and partnership between patients, clinicians, researchers, and health systems. So with PCORNA, we have data on more than 100 million patients, and this data comes from a variety of sources. So to make it useful, we had to put it into a standard structure. So that's why the common data model was created. So shown in blue are the data domains that are currently in the common data model. So we have uh, data domains such as claims data, uh, patient reported outcomes, lab results, demographic information. Uh, the, the domains highlighted in green are ones that we are working to add into the future to the common data model. So shown here is a schematic of how the PCORNet Distributed Research Network works. So if you wanted to use PCORNet to answer a research question, you would submit a question to the virtual front door. The coordinating center would convert that question into a query and send it securely to the network partners. So they would review the query, provide a response, and send it back through the front door to the requester. So I think it's important to note here that this uh, entire process happens locally at the network site, so the data remains secure and it never moves. So you can use PCORNet for many kinds of research. You can use it for uh, pre-research, so feasibility queries, for observational studies such as epidemiology or comparative effectiveness research. You can also use it for interventional studies such as pragmatic or cluster randomization design. So we've been testing the network's functionality in multiple research settings. So PCORI has funded 14 demonstration studies, which are not only answering important patient center research questions, but they're also testing the infrastructure uh, and the key functional aspects of PCORNet. So now I'm going to turn it over to David Arterburn to talk about um, one of our observational demonstration studies. Good morning. Thank you to the committee for the invitation.
speak today. I'm David Arterburn. I'm a general internist and a health services researcher and the Kaiser Permanente Washington. And uh, I'll be speaking about the Picornet Bariatric Study. Um, I'm an employee of Kaiser Permanente Washington and the Washington Permanente Medical Group. Also received research support from Picoria and the NIH in the area of bariatric surgery. Um, the Picornet Bariatric Surgery Study is unique for me in that I've been doing research on electronic health records to understand outcomes of obesity and bariatric surgery for more than 15 years, including studies in the VA and uh, the Kaiser Permanente System and other healthcare re research networks. But this is the first time where we have patient co-PI. And so I actually have two th other co-PIs along with me, Kathleen McTighe, University of Pittsburgh, another clinician and obesity outcomes researcher. And Neely Williams, a patient partner from uh, one of the clinical data research networks that was a bariatric patient and a community engagement organizer who's played an invaluable role from the very beginning in the inception of the project in terms of designing uh, what types of questions would be important to be answered in this, in this cohort, as well as contributing to interpreting the results throughout the course of the study. And we have other patients who are embedded within the care team, within the scientific team, and uh, with an executive stakeholder group I'll mention in a moment. Um, the Picornet Bariatric Project is the most ambitious en endeavor that I've been involved in, and then it includes 42 healthcare systems contributing data to uh, create one database for long-term follow-up of bariatric patients. It's a retrospective study, so we're using electronic health record data that are already collected and looking at the experience of those patients over time. But we include 11 different networks, including the uh, Chicago area, the Greater Plains, uh, Philadelphia, uh, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, uh, University of Utah, New York City hospitals, uh, Kaiser Permanente and Health Partners, uh, integrated healthcare systems, the Boston area, pediatric hospitals, California, Florida, the Mid-South region, including Vanderbilt and uh, University of North Carolina, and then ReachNet in Louisiana area, including Baylor, Scott & White as well in Texas there. So large, geographically diverse, and representative uh, sample population being generated from this type of, of network. And we have a, a large uh, coordinating team to help uh, undertake this work. In the center, we have the core scientific team, which again includes patients, bariatric surgeon, um, and other scientific investigators, and a, an executive bariatric stakeholder advisory group. Uh, Joe Niglowski uh, serves uh, on that particular group as one of our executive bariatric stakeholders, um, helping to advise the project on every aspect of the work, a group of PIs from each of the clinical data research networks advising the team, um, and they, they represent everyone who are in those different healthcare systems um, and their different stakeholders uh, as well throughout the executive stakeholder group. Um, and Kim mentioned the coordinating center team, which helps us facilitate the running of the queries, the extraction of data for analysis, and then those uh, data funnel down to our different work groups for, for analysis. Our stakeholders are playing a key role in the PCORNET Bariatric Project. Our stakeholders include patients, pediatric and adult bari bariatric surgeons, primary and specialty care providers, researchers, and leaders from healthcare organizations for both policy level and advocacy level within different organizations. Um, they work with our PBS team to help us make decisions across the board. Our stakeholders are in involved in helping us formulate questions, collecting and reviewing the data, reviewing medication listings for diabetes medications, for example, reviewing our bariatric procedure codes, analyzing the data, including prioritization of heterogeneity of treatment effects analyses that we're working on, and helping us work on dissemination platforms in terms of connecting with other researchers and healthcare organizations, professional societies to share the results. They've contributed also as co-authors on uh, papers as we're beginning to prepare those. So we have three main scientific aims and a secondary aim. These were generated by the patients and also uh, endorsed by um, a large stakeholder group that endorsed these as the most important issues to tackle in the comparative effectiveness uh, domain. We're studying gastric bypass, adjustable gastric banding, and sleeve gastrectomy because they're the three most commonly performed procedures in the United States. And within these kinds of healthcare systems, they're the types of procedures we're most likely to find data on. We wanted to look at one, three, and five-year outcomes. Uh, the PCORnet uh, system 
is generally begins in 2009 for most, health, most of the healthcare systems that are involved. So looking beyond five years was infeasible. We focus on weight loss as one aim. The second aim is to look at type 2 diabetes <coughs> outcomes. And the third aim is to look at the frequency of major adverse events, including reoperation, reintervention, conversion procedures, and mortality. And we're comparing those three different procedures on those outcomes at one, three, and, and five years. Our secondary aim is qualitative in nature and trying to understand patient preferences around the risks and benefits regarding the choice of whether to undergo bariatric surgery, which procedure to use, and the optimal follow-up care after bariatric surgery. And we're conducting focus groups in both adults and children who have had bariatric surgery and those who have severe obesity and are eligible for but have not had bariatric surgery, including minority patients and patients with lower socioeconomic status in both groups. And we're also conducting interviews with surgeons and other bariatric medicine providers to help understand the evidence that they need and the conversations that they have with patients to help inform these types of treatment decisions. This is a preliminary data. Our cohort paper was just accepted in the Journal of Medical Informatics Research, uh, but this is in press data that um, describes our overall cohort, 65,000 adult bariatric patients from 42 healthcare systems, uh, a mean age for those adult patients of 45 years, that's 3,335 patients over the age of 65, that's 5.1% of our population, predominantly female, Caucasian, with a, a large proportion of African American and 24% report, report uh, Hispanic ethnicity. Mean BMI is typically high, 49, with a, 37% having a BMI greater than or equal to 50%, and comorbidities are common as you would expect in this population with 36% having diabetes, 59% hypertension, um, and these are I identified based on ICD-9 code here, although some laboratory data and other uh, blood pressure and other information is available within the common data model of PCORnet. Some key observations, again, I mentioned that we have uh, many papers and, and, and analyses in the works, and Joe mentioned we're probably about six to nine months from really having the key, the key results in uh, public domain. So, um, but key observations so far is that there's been a really rapid ongoing shift in procedure use within the PCORnet sites, and I think within the United States, it reflects that the sleeve gastrectomy is now by far the most popular bariatric procedure being performed in the U.S., which has rapidly overtaken the gastric bypass procedure. The adjustable gastric band is really just a small single-digit uh, fraction of the total volume of bariatric procedures performed in the United States. Um, and so currently, we're doing mostly sleeve gastrectomy, which was really only introduced within the last seven to eight years, and uh, in terms of very common uh, use and understanding in the U.S., we have a very little longer-term follow-up of that procedure relative to the gastric bypass or even the adjustable gastric banding procedure in that regard. Um, and so studies like this are critical to help inform decision-making that's happening every day when two-thirds of patients are getting the sleeve. There's also significant variability across clinical sites within these 42 different healthcare systems. You've got some sites that almost exclusively do gastric bypass, others that almost exclusively do the sleeve, and others that are doing band, none of which are doing the band primarily, but some are doing it much more commonly than others where some are not doing the band at all. And I think so that heterogeneity in the way in which providers are practicing reflects uncertainty in the evidence base and differences in the way in which clinicians are practicing and being trained or in, in the field of bariatric surgery, which influences the access for patients and the types of decisions that they're making. It may not be driven by evidence so much as uh, clinician uh, skill or um, their own personal preferences. So I think there's a lot uh, to be learned there about how you do shared decision making around bariatric surgery in, in this field. Our upcoming reports include um, our cohort description paper, which will be out very soon. We're comparing weight loss across uh, procedures in adults and adolescents separately, diabetes outcomes across procedures in adults. We have too few adolescents within this cohort for a separate comparative effectiveness research analysis, but so we'll just focus on adults there. We are going to look at safety outcomes in both adults and adolescents, and our 
qualitative paper on attitudes of patients and providers, and we have a methods paper in which we're comparing the impact of using privacy-preserving methods for analysis where we don't share individual level patient data, we just share aggregate data from sites to uh, estimate the treatment effects. And so we'll have a comparison between our individual level data use and aggregate data analysis to report forthcoming. And I think one of the most impressive aspects of this work is we're on track for, it's a two-year project. So everything that I put there is, uh, really goes back to what Kim presented in terms of PCORI about providing more information more efficiently in, uh, for questions that are relevant to patients and providers to help meet the needs of policymakers. And so while the data aren't available today, the fact that we're producing all of this within two years to help answer clinical questions and policy questions that are of need is, is a testament to what kind of work can be done within the PCORNet system. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to take a quick break. Um, I'm going to ask you to please return to the auditorium by 1035. Thank you very much for your attention.
Could everyone please take their seats? We are about to get started. Uh, are we set? All right, I'm just gonna ask the panel uh, to speak close to the microphone so everybody can hear in the back. And we have scheduled public comments. Ben. I think our first speaker is Sydney Warshide. Am I pronouncing that correctly? There's lots of ways to say it. <laughs> <laughs> and just, just a reminder, we're going to ask everybody to limit themselves to four minutes. Yeah, I'm Sid Warshide. I uh, practice in uh, an area that uh, I think the panel members would consider rural. Um, I was. Um, one of Gastric Banning's early adopters. Um, I've placed about 2,500 of these devices in uh, central Illinois patients. Uh, my only interest to disclose is uh, a consulting and investigator, investigator role with Apollo. Um, the uh, results of Gastric Banning have been touched on earlier today. Um, it's really been in the last five years that the, the more compelling reviews have been published. Uh, that attest to its meaningful and durable benefit. Um, I really want to show you that gastric banding may have a particular application for, me, for the Medicare population, which includes patients which are older, patients who are likely averse to, if not fearful, of having surgery, and patients who may have risks for surgery, making more invasive procedures unwise. Um, not to uh, repeat what's been touched on earlier, but just to supplement, uh, you know, durable weight loss has been demonstrated in studies uh, that are uh, with long-term follow-up, enrolling large numbers of patients, being the least invasive procedure, uh, gastric banding should have the lowest post-operative complication rates. Um, other outcomes that have been measured include comorbidity resolution, quality of life improvement, and when you have comorbidity resolution, you have health care savings. Um, with regard to Medicare, uh, the CLOW study uh, followed patients over age 60 after gastric banding and found that weight loss, comorbidity resolution, and quality of life improvement were consistent with those same measured outcomes in younger patients. Uh, when surveyed, 92% of these older folks uh, said they'd recommend the treatment to other obese patients. With zero mortality, these authors concluded that banding is perhaps the most appropriate bariatric procedure for this age group due to safety uh, and, uh, and efficacy. Um, if I could reinforce uh, what's been hinted at earlier today, we need to pursue the treatment of this disease earlier in its course. Um, listed uh, are four prospective multi-center trials showing undeniable fit of gastric banding with lower BMI patients. Uh, Dixon's work was the basis for our, F for our FDA uh, making gastric banding the only uh, treatment appropriate for BMI less than 35. Um, I do believe that as we continue to demonstrate the safety that was uh, illustrated earlier, we're going to find that sleeve gastrectomy is appropriate for this uh, group as well. The graphic I've generated here um, is a representation of what's the most recent report of MBS QIP data. In this comparison, the results of the three other primary operations for weight loss surgery are compared with gastric banding. And what's demonstrated is these operations that we offer are on a spectrum. They're on a spectrum of cost, they're on a spectrum of efficacy, but they're also on a spectrum of adverse events. Um, there's other trends that are not apparent, but they're implied by this graphic. There's a trend from lower to higher BMI as you move from the left to the right. The uh, institutional setting in which these operations might find themselves uh, being used uh, are generally from lower to higher acuity as you move from left to right. And if you use my practice and others like mine around the country, um, those on the, the left are favored in the rural environment. The operations on the right find themselves focused in larger urban centers. Uh, Medicare patients being everywhere, all these options have a place. Uh, patient selection is critical to outcomes in bariatric surgery as is a dedication to their follow-up afterwards. In my experience, patient selection is still self-determined. It's a thing called patient choice. The literature supports what continues to be observed in my clinical practice. 
and that is the mo majority of patients which are still selecting gastric banding as a primary treatment are opposed to and will not pursue more invasive treatments even if given Dr. good Dr. Rocher, I, I, pardon the interruption, but your time is up. Okay. We need to move on to the next speaker, which will be Dr. Gunstead. I'm just trying really hard not to break it. All right, so uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm John Gunstead, and I'm a clinical neuropsychologist coming in from Kent State. And what I'll have a chance to do over the next couple of minutes is talk a little bit about the potential cognitive benefits of bariatric surgery. Uh, just a little bit of information about disclosures. So to provide a little bit of context for why a neuropsychologist might be interested in looking at obesity, and particularly severe obesity and bariatric surgery, here's a little bit of background. So we know that midlife obesity is very strongly associated with stroke, Alzheimer's disease, vascular dementia, Parkinson's disease, basically all the, the kind of the most significant adverse brain outcomes in older adults. But even in individuals who don't develop these conditions, we know that obesity is associated with accelerated cognitive decline and abnormalities on brain imaging. So the kind of the rough rule of thumb for something like this is that as individuals age, the carrying obesity really seems to increase uh, brain aging by about eight to 10 years. But there's good reason to think that severe obesity might actually confer even greater effects. So here's some kind of work from, from our lab where we show that there's a significant interaction between age and severity of obesity. So as we can see kind of by the darker line down at the bottom, the individuals who with advancing age with more severe obesity show greater cognitive impairment. A more striking example is found in this slide where we had the chance to look at 170 individuals with severe obesity. And what we're seeing here are the prevalence lines of individuals who meet diagnostic criteria for MCI or mild cognitive impairment, which is a commonly used rubric for identifying does this individual meet clinical demands or clinical requirements for some type of memory disorder or other brain-based disorder. So as you can see, the rates, the prevalent rates are, are very, very high. Um, again, at, for the overall sample is more than 50%. As to, again, to put this number in context, if you see the small dotted line way down at the bottom, that's the rate of MCI in individuals who are age 54 in the general community. And the dotted line up above, just above 20%, is uh, the rate of MCI in individuals in the community who are age 68. So severe obesity in this case is associated with, again, kind of a more than two times increase in the rate of MCI, which may ultimately kind of progress to conditions like Alzheimer's disease and other brain-based disorders. So in taking a look at all this, and again, for an individual who's kind of from the Midwest, so kind of inherently optimistic, the general thought is if gaining weight or kind of increasing weight actually harms the brain, potentially losing weight might be able to heal the brain in some sort of way. And we had the chance to do this through the, the lab's ancillary study, where we had the chance to test cognitive function before surgery and at several time points later. So the first and kind of most maybe important part of all of this is we found that there was no significant deleterious effects on cognitive function. So individuals who went through an uncomplicated surgery showed no difference from controls in time point before surgery to 12 weeks later. Again, kind of arguing that it's safe for the brain. Much more exciting is the possibility of post-operative improvement. So following these individuals over time, what we found is that cognition improved and improved rapidly. So even by 12 weeks post-op, individuals showed significant improvements in memory and executive functioning. So that includes things like problem solving, planning, organizing, relative to severely obese controls. And looking through this, we saw that these gains continued up to about one year and then persisted over time. Really, again, arguing that going through this weight loss procedure, for many individuals, it led to improved memory and kind of ultimately, hopefully, uh, improvements in their everyday functioning. Particularly relevant today and for individuals who would be kind of Medicaid-eligible individuals, we find that the same benefits actually occur in individuals who are above and below 55 years of age. So when we look at this rate, um, again, there is some reason to potentially concern that obesity over the course of time might actually harm the brain in a way that would be irreversible, and we found no evidence for that. So older adults, in this case, again, 55 plus, who went through bariatric surgery procedures, showed the same rate of improvement in memory and executive functioning as did, as did younger adults going through these procedures. And again, why this is particularly noteworthy is we know that this type of cognitive impairment is associated with other bad outcomes in other populations. So persons with cardiovascular disease or diabetes who have cognitive impairment are more likely to be hospitalized, more likely to be less adherent, and actually have premature mortality relative to their peers. Thank you much for your time. Thank you. <clears throat> Next is Dr. English.
Uh, thank you for the opportunity for me to speak here today. My name is Wayne English. I'm a bariatric surgeon at uh, Vanderbilt University and a co-chair of the Standards and Verification Committee for the Committee on Metabolic and Bariatric Surgery. I've also participated in several clinical trials evaluating gastric balloons. Here are my disclosures. Today I'm going to be speaking to you on the importance of MBSAQIP accreditation and then briefly discuss gastric balloons. The MBSAQIP standards are predicated on creating a common theme for every metabolic and bariatric surgery practice in an effort to reduce practice variation and improve overall quality of care. Site inspections are conducted every three years to ensure centers are maintaining high quality structure process and outcome measures. Real-time non-risk adjusted and semi-annual risk adjusted reports are uh, provided to assist with quality improvement efforts. The history of the development of uh, MBSAQIP, uh, I'm not going to go into any major details other than this is a relatively new program with much more robust, robust uh, data collection than the previous programs that existed. There are currently over 800 centers in the United States, and a review of the most current nationwide inpatient sample data available to us demonstrated that 92% of the centers performing metabolic and bariatric surgery in the United States are, are accredited centers. Therefore, we are capturing the lion's share of the metabolic and bariatric surgery data across the country. While st when the standards were first developed in 2014, there were over 1,100 public comments considered before they were finalized. With lessons learned that the standards were implemented, they were subsequently revised in 2016. Future revisions of the standards will take place every three years to ensure satisfactory updates with new trends or the correct issues with the existing standards. The core standards have a minimum volume requirement of 50 cases annually to gain comprehensive accreditation status, but centers performing lower volume can still become accredited by performing procedures on low acuity patients. The standards are verified during site surveys during, uh, performed every three years, and the results of the surveys are reviewed by blinded application reviewers, and if there is a disagreement, it's adjudicated by special committees. <coughs> to ensure that new procedures are being introduced safely, ASMVS developed a new pathway to standardize the introduction and the approval of emerging technology, new procedures, and variation of existing techniques. MBSAQIP requires data, data entry for all procedures, and it can re centers can readily perform procedures if it's listed as an approved procedure. However, IRB oversight is required if a procedure is not improved. An important change in the standards was made to capture all data of emerging technology, new procedures, and variation of existing techniques, which will lead me to the next topic of gastric balloons. I'm not going to go into any details of this. This has been brought up in previous discussion. Um, other than uh, <clears throat> to help assist with the answering question number three for the additional discussion topic section, I would like to ask you to consider the following. With the introduction of new technology and increasing number of procedures being performed in the United States, 36% increase in, since 2011 is critical to monitor outcomes closely. <coughs> and the MBSD QIP provides a platform that are uh, currently capturing data from 92% of inpatient centers, centers across the country. I want to thank you for your time today. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Still is the next presenter. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm a little bit in a minority that I'm not a surgeon. I'm just an internist and obesity medicine specialist. And I'd like to present uh, our bariatric surgery um, outcomes to try to answer some of your questions from Geisinger Health System in Central Pennsylvania. Here are my disclosures. Um, I speak for a couple of pharmaceutical companies. I do have an investigator-initiated grant through Ethicon Index Surgery, and I'm an employed uh, physician at Geisinger. So our Geisinger cohort, uh, bariatric surgery cohort, is pretty typical as what we heard about 80% female, 20% fem uh, male. A little difference is we have longer follow-up. We have about 70% follow-up at eight years. Uh, and our BMI is a little higher. Uh, the average BMI that they operate on is 51. 
In answering uh, some of the questions with regards to the Medicare population with weight loss, I've split it up between over 65 and under 65, and you can see uh, the percent weight loss after uh, five years. Of note, the patients under 65 were uh, 678 Medicare patients, and older 65 were 150 about 150. And this is pretty typical of what we see in our general populations with regards to weight loss, so very durable uh, over the long term. With regards to diabetes remission, I also broke it up not only between under and over 65, but patients that were on insulin preoperatively, and you can see the remission uh, rates um, between the two groups. One thing that I think is important from an internist in treating diabetes, it's great that we look at remission rates, but a lot of improvement is uh, on getting off of insulin, getting their lipids under control, all these bundles that were uh, so important to us with regards to patient care significantly improved whether they remit their type 2 diabetes or not. With regards to the Medicare population, the change of uh, quality of life, you can see here a significant improvement in quality of life before and after surgery, both on the Medicare populations uh, younger than 65 and older than 65. Uh, switching gears to all uh, patient populations within our Geisinger, not just the Medicare, but looking at all-cause mortality. So these were age uh, and matched uh, controls um, of individuals within our integrative health system versus individuals that underwent bariatric surgery. And you can see that there's a significant improvement in all-cause mortality up uh, over 10 years or at 10 years. Uh, with regards to MI stroke and heart failure, also um, with regards to cardiovascular events, to answer your uh, questions about that, a significant improvement. And just to split these up a little bit, what Dr. DiMaria Di said today, what was really significant was the improvement in, in congestive heart failure. And as what was uh, outlined today, is very, very important, very costly, and very uh, uh, high morbidity and mortality for the patients. Uh, switching gears uh, with regards to the musculoskeletal and what I think is a barrier to care is a SWIFT trial that I uh, serve as PI in a multi-center looking at surgical weight loss improvement of functional status trajectories following total knee replacement. We know that degenerative joint disease is much higher in the, obese po in the patients with obesity and actually patients re with obesity require arthroplasty about five to ten years earlier. Um, there's been really no uh, uh, randomized trials, and we know that the 30-day postoperative complication uh, following knee replacement is much higher in individuals with a BMI of 40. So uh, we, this is a, the SWIFT trial is to look at, does bariatric surgery before total knee replacement improve both perioperative and long-term outcomes in extremely obese patients? And does bariatric surgery before TKA actually delay or uh, negate the need for the arthroplasty. And so this is the um, pathway. We have individuals that will go through the control arm and individuals that will have bariatric surgery and see afterwards how they do. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, Dr. Girapino, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Thank you very much. I'm Sai Pishamon Girapino. I'm the Bariatric Endoscopy Fellow from the Brigham and Women's Hospital. Um, GI Dynamics supports my trip today, um, otherwise no other financial relationships. Obesity is associated with multiple comorbidities, including cardiovascular diseases, fatty liver, and type 2 diabetes. As the number of obesity patients increases, the number of patients affected by these comorbidities will continue to rise. In 2015, 30 million Americans, or approximately 10% of the U.S. population, had diabetes. This translates to approximately $245 billion U.S. dollars spent on caring for this patient population. Traditionally, diabetes is treated with oral and injectable medications such as insulin. However, for some patients, their glycemic control remains inadequate despite optimal um, maximal medications and also combination of medical therapy. 
On the other hand, ruin y gastric bypass surgery has been shown in multiple studies to be effective at treating diabetes. In fact, recently the international diabetes organizations have released a joint statement suggesting that ruin y gastric bypass be a recommended therapy for diabetes in patients with BMI of higher than 40. It should also be considered in patients with BMI of higher than 30 whose glycemic control remains suboptimal. Nevertheless, despite its efficacy, only 1% of the patients who are eligible for surgery undergo the surgery. Given this gap in therapy, a breakthrough technology known as duodenal jejunal bypass liner was, was recently developed to treat diabetes and obesity. The device is a 60 centimeter fluoropolymer sleeve that is endoscopically placed into the duodenum and proximal jejunum. It mimics the ruin y gastric bypass anatomy by preventing a contact between food and the proximal small intestine. Additionally, it accel ac accelerates food progression and allows the nutrients to reach the distal small bowel earlier. This leads to a spike in gut hormones that, lead to, that are beneficial for weight loss and glycemic control. A recent meta-analysis of 17 published studies shows that this, this liner is effective at treating diabetes and obesity. At one year after device implant, which is when the liner is scheduled to be removed, hemoglobin A1C decreases by 1.3% compared to baseline. Compared to the control patients who undergo a sham procedure or lifestyle modification alone, the liner patients had a greater decrease in hemoglobin A1C of 0.9%. This metabolic effect appears to last up to at least six months post-explant. Uh, post From a weight loss standpoint, at the time of explant, patients lose approximately 11.3 kilograms, which correspond to a decrease in BMI of 4.1, percent total weight loss of 19, and percent excess weight loss of 39. This effect on weight loss appears to be significant at at least one year post-explant. Similar to ruin y gastric bypass, the liner has been shown to be associated with an increase in gut hormones peptide YY and ghrelin, and a decrease in GIP. This suggests that the mechanisms of the liner are similar to the mechanisms of ruin y gastric bypass, a known effective therapy for type 2 diabetes. Given its minimally invasive nature, this liner may expand the number of patients who are receiving effective therapy for diabetes in the near future. Additionally, this would allow us to treat complications of diabetes, such as end-stage cardiovascular diseases, end-stage kidney diseases, and death. Thank you very much. Leslie Narrowmore is our next speaker. Uh, my name is Leslie Narrowmore, and I am the Director of Reimbursement at the American Gastroenterological Association. Um, I have no conflicts. Um, so as internists, specialists in, in, I'm sorry, as internists, specialists in digestive disorders and endoscopists, gastroenterologists are uniquely positioned to play an important role in the multidisciplinary treatment of obesity. The AGA is leading a multidisciplinary initiative to guide gastroenterologists in the comprehensive care of patients with obesity. Our practice guide on obesity and weight management, education and resources, known as POWER, provides physicians with an evidence-based, comprehensive, multidisciplinary process to guide and personalize innovative obesity care for safe and effective weight management. It's vital to understand the importance of embracing obesity as a chronic, relapsing disease that requires long-term, multidisciplinary approach to management. Patients who are overweight or obese present to gastroenterology clinics daily with obesity-related gastroesophageal reflux disease and its associated risks of Barrett's esophagus and esophageal cancer, gallstone disease, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, and an increased risk for colon polyps and cancer. Because gastrointestinal disorders resulting from obesity are frequent and often present sooner than type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease, gastroenterologists should be on the front line in providing effective therapy. <clears throat> there is rich evidence supporting improved health outcomes after treatment with non-surgical endoscopic bariatric therapies, or EBT, which are provided by gastrointestinal endoscopists in patients, which include the Medicare population that other presenters have provided in detail. In addition, the AGA's Power White Paper 
and episode of care framework for the management of obesity provide ample evidence that EBT intervention uh, benefits outweigh harm and highlights the necessity of using these tools as part of a comprehensive support program to provide long-term benefit. Instead of, instead of a linear care pathway, the power program care cycle is circular to present the fact that obesity is a chronic disease that requires a lifelong multidisciplinary approach for effective long-term therapy. Given the, cha given the challenges of both achieving weight loss and sustained weight management, approaches that combine therapies can improve clinical efficacy. While bariatric surgery is an option for patients who meet Medicare's criteria, low adoption demonstrates that patients often have a psychological bias against anatomy-altering surgery, its risks, and potential costs. To reach more Medicare beneficiaries with obesity, MedCAC should consider coverage of EBT for patients who are unwilling to undergo life-altering surgery, who might find a non-surgical approach more acceptable, or for patients with multiple comorbidities who are not good candidates for bariatric surgery. Additionally, the truly minimally invasive approach of EBT may also allow for earlier interventions at lower class levels of obesity. The POWER program provides physicians with a comprehensive multidisciplinary process to guide and personalize obesity care that incorporates concomitant use of obesity therapies based on individual patients' comorbidity and comorbidities and goals. EBT has proven successful when supported by comprehensive obesity care support. However, there are barriers to widespread adoption. Barriers to care include the 1987 National Coverage Determination, or NC for gastric balloon for treatment of obesity, 100.11, which established non-coverage of, gastro of gastric balloon devices. Gastric balloons in use today are both safe and effective as demonstrated in pivotal FDA trials. However, the NCD has not been updated since its implementation 30 years ago. We ask CMS and MedPAC to consider retiring NCD 100.11. Given the crisis of the obesity epidemic, the profound costs to patient health, and healthcare spending, EBTs are effective therapies that can safely improve the treatment of obesity and are an important advancement to the existing therapeutic options. Thank you for the opportunity to provide input. Dr. Shelby Sullivan is our next presenter. Thank you for inviting me to talk here today. I do have some disclosures. I have both had research and grant supports as listed here, as well as consulting um, for uh, a number of the different devices that we're going to be talking about today. I'll start by just briefly talking about uh, weight loss in relation to cardiovascular mortality, or cardiovascular um, outcomes. This was a uh, post hoc analysis that was done from the Look Ahead trial that included 4,406 subjects aged 45 to 76. The average age was greater than 55. This goes back to the data that was done, or that was presented earlier today with looking at outcomes in patients who are in the older adult population or the Medicare population. What was found in this post hoc analysis is that even though in the greater Look Ahead trial there was not a difference in cardiovascular outcomes in patients who um, were in the intensive lifestyle therapy arm compared to the control arm, patients who had 10% or more total body weight loss did have a reduction in cardiovascular outcomes. This is important when we start talking about our endoscopic bariatric therapies, which I will get to in a minute. We have a number of devices that have recently been approved for use by the FDA. These include the intergastric balloons, which are shown on this slide, um, that include the reshaped dual balloon system and the Orbera balloon system, which are both fluid-filled balloons that are placed endoscopically and removed endoscopically, as well as the Obalon balloon system, which is a three balloon system that are swallowed over, at, that are contained in capsules and are swallow, swallowed over time and filled with a nitrogen mixed gas. All of these balloons are removed six months after initial placement, and all of them are removed endoscopically. When we look at the comparison of these intragastric balloons, just to look at the data, there is level one evidence that these balloons are effective compared to control group. There is a difference in weight loss between the uh, studies that were done that were just randomized controlled compared to those that were randomized sham controlled, with both Reshape and Obalon being randomized sham controlled trials. And there was a serious adverse event rate that was in the 10% arm for, range for Orbera and Reshape. However, these were mostly driven by um, uh, the majority of these serious adverse events were because of dehydration from nausea and vomiting. We have since become much better at being able to treat these and prevent those from happening, and the serious adverse event rates in clinical practice are significantly lower. The other thing to point out from this is that the weight loss that we see in these trials is significantly lower than the weight loss that we see in clinical practice. This is data from both Reshape and Orbera um, clinical, clinical um, case series compared with the clinical trials, and you see that there's significantly greater weight loss in the uh, clinical 
uh, series, the clinical case series, which are in the dark blue. In addition to that, there is some long-term weight loss evidence with these balloons as well. We have this study that came out of Europe, which shows that weight loss maintenance in at least 23% of patients occurred with the Orbera balloon system at five years. <clears throat> now, in addition to that, we had weight loss maintenance of almost 90% in the Obalon balloon system in the randomized sham control trial in the US as well. Going on to our next device, we have the Aspire Assist system, which was approved for use as well, which is similar in concept to the percutaneous endoscopic gastrostomy tube that has a known serious adverse event rate of 2% um, in the older adult population. Um, this, include, this is aspiration of gastric contents 20 minutes after a meal, two to three times a day, and removes 25 to 30% of those calories. However, that aspiration only accounts for about 50 to 80% of the weight loss, and the remaining weight loss is due to lifestyle changes in mealtime behaviors, which actually reduce the amount of food that's actually consumed. Weight loss with this device is approximately 14 to 21 percent at one year with a limited number of, of patients out to four years that demonstrates um, about 20 percent weight loss out at four years. So in summary, we have the uh, balloons that have 10 percent or more weight loss in clinical practice at one year and have a very good safety profile, and aspiration therapy that has 14 to 21 percent as well. And we would recommend that if CMS would like to get more evaluation in these older adults, that they would do this in a registry program, as there is not a funding mechanism to actually get this data in this population. Thank you, Dr. Thank Shelby. You. Dr. Hutter is next. I would like to thank the panel for the honor of presenting today. My name is Matt Hutter. I'm a bariatric surgeon. I'm the director of the MGH Weight Center and the director of the Codman Center for Clinical Effectiveness. I do have a disclosure. I'm the PI in a study funded by PCORI, and I'll be discussing that study today. As we've talked about before, an accreditation program has been established for metabolic and bariatric surgery, combining the American College of Surgeons with the ASMBS to create the MBS AQIP. Dr. David Hoyt is the executive director of the, of the American College of Surgeons. The American College of Surgeons overlooks a cancer database, the trauma database, and he wanted to relay a message that he thinks that the bariatric data collection program and what the bariatric society has done is one of the, the shining examples of what can be done in surgery to improve the quality of care. So specifically, we developed an accreditation program, bariatric-specific data points, we're a qualified clinical data registry, we're putting in patient-reported outcomes, I'll go over some of those details. The MBSA QIP data collection has been talked about before. It's 100% of cases. 95% of all bariatric cases across the country are currently enrolled in this accreditation program, and all their cases are being included. This is clinically rich data. This is audited, trained nurse reviewers or data collectors who are using standardized definitions, not ICD-9 codes, to look at each medical record to look at outcomes, bariatric-specific outcomes, weight-related weight diseases, diabetes, hypertension, hypercholesterolemia, obstructive sleep apnea, and not just at 30 days, it's 30 days, six months, one year, and annually thereafter. So a very strong, robust data collection program, which is the underpinning not only for accreditation, but most importantly for quality improvement, and also for the opportunity when we have new techniques and technologies, how to look at them and their safety with regards to that. When the sleeve gastrectomy was started to be done, there was not a CPT code. We added a variable before it was done. When the FDA was about to approve these devices, we add, added variables for the endoscopic therapeutic procedures. And we mandate that they cover all those information. So very robust data that we can capture important information now, comparative across 95% of all the hospitals in the country and in the future with new devices. High quality data, prospectively gathered. Each site, trained, audited. The data collectors are not involved in patient care, so if you're the nurse the pre or the surgeon taking care, you can't enter the data on that patient. It has to be objective. Discrete standardized definitions, and it's audited with site reviews of the data as well. We also applied and worked with CMS in order to become a qualified clinical data registry, the only program of the American College of Surgeons that is currently a QCDR, the bariatric program is. Again, a shining example of what we can do. So working with CMS, we've developed that this is a qualified clinical data registry, and we've come up with our different metrics in order to, uh, to do this. So these are the nine different metrics that are currently available for the QCDR. We update these uh, uh, yearly, and, uh, and, and, and surgeons are currently participating in this program. 
We're also developing patient reported outcomes. So as been talked about before, patient reported outcomes are what matters most to the patients. So we've been recently been funded by the PCORI Institute, um, a, a four years grant, the long-term outcomes of bariatric surgical techniques, working with the American College of Surgeons, with the Mass General Hospital, and with the MBSAQIP to bring patient reported outcomes nationally to this data collection program. We've gone through an alpha pilot, we have a data collection program, and we're currently in a beta pilot to roll this out. We're looking forward to voluntary national implementation as soon as uh, July of uh, January of this upcoming year, though this is right on the works. The PCORI grant conduct focus groups, again, alpha pilot to look at this, a data collection program uh, company in order to, uh, to, to look at this, and we're using validated metrics. So what we've had is 20 different focus groups in order to identify the, the factors that make the biggest difference to the patients in order to collect that information. But most importantly, we want to report this back. So this is the right operation for the right patient tool, this robust data collection program, get it back to the patient level with this tool. So patient reported outcomes and comparative effectiveness all back to the patient as well. I want to thank you very much for the opportunity to present today. Next presenter is Dr. Scott. Hello, my name is John Scott and I am a bariatric surgeon in Greenville, South Carolina and I'm also the access to care chairman for the ASMBS. My disclosures are listed here. We've spent hours reviewing the ample evidence in support of bariatric surgery and obesity care in the Medicare population. I'd like to focus my comments on a significant barrier to care that exists for many patients. Sadly and unfairly, universal coverage for bariatric surgical services does not yet exist. In addition, many local coverage decisions force Medicare receiving patients who suffer from obesity and who are interested in bariatric surgery to navigate a maze of arbitrary preoperative requirements. One such barrier to care is the mandatory preoperative six-month medical weight management program. These programs delay surgical care. This is unique among surgical interventions for chronic life-threatening disease processes. Evidence demonstrates that LCD-required delays have unintentionally led to patient frustration, delays in definitive obesity care, disease progression, especially type 2 diabetes. These mandates unnecessarily increase medical costs as medical providers have to perform visits and facilitate these programs. There is an absence of reasonable level medical evidence to support this practice. Therefore, it is the position of the ASMBS, and in my opinion, that the requirement for documentation of a prolonged preoperative diet prior to bariatric surgery services are performed is inappropriate and counterproductive. Policies such as these uh, delay, impede, and otherwise interfere with life-saving and cost-effective treatment, and these are unacceptable without supporting evidence. Since no large-scale studies exist which indicate that LCD-mandated six-month medical weight loss programs significantly alter post-operative course of patients, are there any studies that show otherwise? In fact, there are several studies that support the opposite conclusion. In this one study, 1,400 patients were stratified by paramix and pre-surgical weight loss requirements in the matched into groups. A regression analysis was performed, and no significant differences were found in weight loss outcomes between the mandated weight management group and the comparison group one to two years. Other studies indicate that two weak, very low calorie diets do not impact intraoperative time, intraoperative blood loss, or complications. Six months of intense behavioral therapy versus standard preoperative care demonstrated no differences in weight loss after six to 12 months post op. And six months of medical weight loss versus usual care demonstrated no differences in weight loss or behavioral outcomes. I recently reviewed our own internal data from GHS between 2014 and 2015. We obtained data on 354 patients, and of these, 75% 75, 75 of patients were required by insurance-mandated preoperative weight management programs, and 25% of patients had no preoperative insurance-mediated delay. We found that participation in an insurance or LCD-mandated weight management program for three to six months prior to the performance of bariatric surgery was not associated with any improved patient outcomes. To be specific, we saw no significant differences in patient rate of follow-up, percentage of excess weight loss, readmission, reoperation at 12 months post-surgical follow-up. To our knowledge, there are no medical or surgical consequences for these patients who are not required to, to complete an insurance-mandated weight loss program. This suggests that undergoing bariatric surgery without completing an insurance-mandated weight management program is safe and effective in the short term. In conclusion, there is no randomized control trial, no large prospective study, or no meta-analysis that supports the use of LCD-mandated preoperative weight management programs. 
This practice is arbitrary, capricious, unnecessary, and often delays life-saving treatment, contributes to patient attrition, and is most likely unethical. Decisions regarding the readiness of a patient for bariatric surgery should be made between a doctor and a patient. In future coverage decisions or bundled payment constructions, this barrier to care should be universally abandoned. Thank you for your time. Dr. Sedan. Uh, Ranjan Sudan, Duke University. Uh, I serve on the Executive Council of the ASMBS and I was previously the Research Committee Chair. Obesity is a chronic disease that is successfully treated by different primary bariatric operations. A number of factors are considered when selecting a particular operation, but the initial operation may not result in adequate weight loss or resolution of comorbid conditions. Or given its chronic nature, weight gain or comorbid conditions may recur despite initial success. The purpose of this talk is to evaluate outcomes and fill a gap in knowledge after reoperative bariatric surgery from a large multi-institutional database of the ASMBS. For the purposes of this study, reoperations were divided into corrective, for instance, a slip band or a gastrogastric fistula, or corrective operations in which an operation was converted to a different type of bariatric operation. The volume distribution in this study was there were 450,000 patients that were considered, and the vast majority of them, 94%, did not undergo reoperations. About 6% of these patients underwent reoperations. And only of that, about 30% underwent conversion operations, suggesting the robustness of the primary bariatric operations. The length of stay for these reoperations was about two days, and not that much clinically higher than 1.78 days for the primary bariatric operations. Weight loss after conversion to the various bariatric operations is shown here, as would be expected as the severity of the operation increased, the weight loss after the conversion was also seen to be higher. Comorbid conditions uh, are listed here, uh, and the first column, which is primary operations, is uh, compared to the reoperations in the second column. And what we see is resolution of comorbid conditions as measured by a decrease in uh, either medication or loss of device for sleep apnea was very good at one year and quite com comparable. Severe adverse events were measured both at 30 days and at one year, uh, and they were compared to primary operations versus reoperations. And again, in reoperations, severe adverse events at 30 days was 2%, and at one year was 2.42%, not that much higher from the primary operations at 1.6 and 1.87% respectively. Similarly, mortality rates at 30 days and at one year were not that much higher for reoperations compared to primary operations. Um, death rate at uh, one year was 0.26% after reoperations. So, in summary, most bariatric patients do not need reoperations. Among those who do, given the chronic nature of this disease, the complication rate is low and outcomes are comparable to primary bariatric procedures for both weight loss and resolution of comorbid conditions. Prior to the stud this study, there was a great amount of reluctance, both on the part of patients, uh, surgeons, as well as payers, to reimburse for reoperative bariatric surgery, primarily because they thought the complication rates were going to be too high and the benefits unknown. We have shown that both the complication rates as well as the benefits uh, are certainly there, and this has helped us actually obtain uh, coverage from our local payer for reoperations. I thank you for your time. Dr. Howell will present next. Okay, thank you for the opportunity to present and address the panel today. I'm Dr. Peter Hollowell from the University of Virginia, and I'm the Director of Bariatric Surgery there. I have no financial disclosures.
Long-term outcomes are difficult to obtain in the United States due to many factors, including a mobile society, changes in insurance status, cost, and a lack of an integrated records and systems. In an attempt to fill the gap, we looked at our long-term results. Last year, we published our 10-year results. <clears throat> we were able to obtain 60% complete follow-up, and what you can see here was good maintenance of weight loss at 10 years, and a decrease in significant comorbid conditions, including diabetes, cardiac disease, obstructive sleep apnea, hypertension, DJD, and pulmonary conditions. <clears throat> this is a paper out of Western Australia. This was included because 95% of the patients in this cohort had laparoscopic adjustable gastric banding. The mortality rate was 0.01%, and that is in line with what we see in the United States for that procedure. And in this cohort, only 1.4% of the patients underwent a revision. And as you can see, a decreased hospitalization and a low long-term all-cause mortality rate. This paper from the from Sweden using the SOS database that Dr. Di Maria talked about earlier, looks at female-specific cancers, including breast, endometrial, and ovarian, in women with obesity. The overall reduction in cancer for the surgical group and over half of the cancers in this study were female-specific. And again, you can see great follow-up at 18 years. This is Ted Adams' paper out of Utah. Again, good long-term follow-up, 24 years with a mean of 12 and a half. Good patient accrual. The cancer incidence was decreased by 24% in the surgical group. Cancers likely to be obesity-related were decreased 38%. Overall cancer mortality was 46% lower. And interestingly, mortality from non-obesity-related cancers were also 47% lower in the surgery group. Another paper from Ted Adams' group out of Utah is a cohort study, again, with high numbers. In this study, they broke out their patients by age classification, less than 35, 35 to 44, 45 to 54, and 55 to 74. Their follow-up was over seven years, and gastric bypass provided a survival benefit even in the older age group and in a subgroup of 65 to 74-year-olds. Again, we bring up the Swedish obesity uh, subject study. This paper was uh, published in 2007, so a little bit over 10 years ago. This is one of the first and longest term follow-up studies in the literature and now out well over 25 years. Patients were enrolled between the ages of 37 and 60, matched one-to-one -one with non-surgical controls, and there were over 2,000 patients in each arm. Most of the patients had vertical banded gastroplasty, which is something we don't do now. Here is the uh, survival curve. So in summary, I've shown you data Greater than five years, bariatric surgery produces an overall decrease in mortality compared to no intervention, a decrease in cancer intervention, and there are now 14 papers showing survival advantage of bariatric surgery. Thank Excuse you. Time is up. Thank you. Dr. LeMasters. Thank you for the opportunity to present today about a topic that I think is very important and I'm very passionate about. My name is Teresa LeMasters and I am a community practice bariatric surgeon from Des Moines, Iowa, and I work with Unity Point Clinic there. I do a lot of work with the American College of Surgeons and with ASMBS regarding accreditation and access to care. Today I'm representing ASMBS in my discussion. So these are my disclosures. My only personal financial disclosure is that I've been a speaker for Gore and Associates, 
and a faculty for ASMBS. The rest of the ones are related to ASMBS. So you've already heard many times today <laughs> that obesity is a chronic progressive disease. And there's definitely been increased awareness, not just in the medical community, but in the public regarding the seriousness of this disease. Recently, multiple healthcare providers have actually come together to collaborate on the treatment of this disease. ASMBS has led the way in establishing collaborative partnerships with healthcare professionals with development of the National Obesity Collaborative Care Summit. This has been going on for the past four years. This includes participation by multiple specialty societies to develop collaborative guidelines to improve the care of patients with obesity. The goal of the summit are educational, advocacy, and to develop collaborative guidelines and position statements. Many specialties are involved. Surgeons are involved through American College of Surgeons and ASMBS, the AMA, the American Heart Association, the Academy of Nutrition and Diet Dietetics, Endocrinology, Oncology, OBGYN, Orthopedics, Anesthesiology, and many others. The healthcare environment really has shifted. There's a much higher emphasis on high quality outcomes with excellent patient satisfaction and all at appropriate cost levels. To be successful in this model of care, we must have a collaborative approach to our treatment of patients. So we know an important first step in the treatment of patients with obesity is just to start the conversation. But many medical providers actually shy away from this conversation. There can actually be many barriers for primary care physicians. This can include things such as inadequate training, their own bias or pessimism that people can actually make these changes, and just simply inadequate time, especially in our EHR heavy world. So to facilitate that conversation, we felt like we need to better understand the public's perception of this disease of obesity. So in that end, ASMBS commissioned a study with the NORC, or the National Opinion Research Center out of Chicago. And the results of that study show that the population understands obesity is a very serious disease, even more serious than cancer. But there's a disconnect on how it affects them individually and about the effectiveness of treatment options. Four in 10 Americans who meet the BMI criteria for obesity had never even talked with their doctor about their weight. Three quarters of the respondents said, yes, I've tried to lose weight on my own before. And more than 60% said they believe that healthcare insurance should help pay for the treatment for obesity, including bariatric surgery. So I'll tell you, with bariatric surgery, we've just begun to scratch the surface in the treatment of this complex disease. Bariatric surgery is a safe, effective, and important piece of a comprehensive treatment strategy for this complex disease. This is a life-threatening disease that affects a large portion of our population. Thank you for your time and attention. Dr. Leslie. Well, thank you very much uh, to the chair and to the panel for the opportunity to present. I'm Dan Leslie uh, at the University of Minnesota. I'm the medical director for uh, now our more comprehensive uh, weight management center. Uh, the University of Minnesota performed uh, the first two bariatric procedures back in 1954 at the VA Medical Center, so a long history. Uh, so I will go forward. Disclosures, uh, Medtronic uh, has paid for my travel uh, to come here to present, um, and we worked with their health economics group uh, to uh, produce a variety of data about the Medicare population. And this is really a summary um, of our findings. Uh, number one, we found that uh, about two-thirds of Medicare beneficiaries undergoing bariatric surgery are actually under 65 years of age. Uh, and so to look at just that older population um, it doesn't uh, provide the full picture. The average age of Medicare beneficiaries having bariatric surgery is actually about 46 years of age, while that in the com commercial population is 43 years. And so of the 70 studies looked at in the ARC uh, review, uh, 57 studies were on patient populations with a mean um, age of 55 years and older, 
um, and excluded um, a lot of patients, uh, certainly uh, who are inside the Medicare population. Um, in addition, the conclusion of the ARC review that the strength of evidence is low to moderate excludes at least 25 randomized clinical trials, um, technology assessments by the California um, uh, Technology Group, the state of Washington, uh, healthcare advocacy groups, and numerous prospective and retrospective uh, trials directly relatable to the majority of Medicare beneficiaries who undergo bariatric surgery. So a uh, published body of evidence clearly supports safety and efficacy of bariatric surgery uh, for treating obesity and related comorbidities. So very briefly, um, so the average age of Medicare bariatric patients is 46. Two-thirds were disabled. About two-thirds uh, were less than 65 years of age. Um, and uh, that chart outlines that. Uh, this has been relatively stable over time. And you can see from between 2011 and now 2015, the, the number who are disabled with end-stage renal or with end-stage renal disease represent over 70 uh, percent. Um, and then a higher proportion of women and minorities um, are having bariatric surgery inside the Medicare database. Uh, Seventy-six uh, percent of the disabled are female, um, and uh, sixty-seven percent of, of elderly are female as well. Uh, and then the percent of Medicare bariatric surgeries in the non-white population, and you can see that in the bottom right there, disabled, 28 percent, elderly, 9 percent. Uh, I'm not going to run through the rest of the slides. There's a lot of them. I think a, a main focus, too, on the ARC review was the, the uh, concept of minimal weight loss requirement. Um, in the look-ahead study, targeting a weight loss requirement of 10 percent at four years, 23 percent of the intensive lifestyle intervention group achieved that amount of weight loss. In bariatric surgery, at least one study, and we don't typically cast our data in terms of minimal weight loss. Patients don't want to hear that. They want to hear how much weight they can lose. The, the number is 99 percent lose at least 10 percent at two years and 96 percent at six years. Um, and you've seen a lot of other data on durability. Um, and I, I think that bariatric surgery certainly offers good outcomes for our patients. Thank you. And our last of our <clears throat> Scheduled speakers is Dr. Pat Petri. So I'm Tony Petrick. I'm from Geisinger Medical Center. And we got a slide up there. Um, and I'm going to talk to you really about, about two key points. First, I'd like to reiterate what Dr. Dr. Leslie just said. When you look at the demographics of the Medicare population undergoing bariatric surgery, they do not look like the demographics of patients in the United States undergoing elective surgery. They, in fact, look very much like the demographics of the studies you've heard uh, cited and quoted today. Only Dr. Finkelstein looked in health affairs at this and found only about 25 percent of the, the uh, bariatric surgical patients were over the age of 65. The two key points I really want to talk about are the critical importance of our Medicare patients having their surgery in institutions that are accredited. And there are really two reasons for this. You've seen most of my slides before. One is safety, and the other is that as we look at the agenda and the implication that there are care gaps that need to be bridged, the absolute best way to do this is under the, the uh, uh, umbrella of, of accreditation. So these are slides you've seen before. We're going back to data that was uh, uh, reviewed in the late 1990s. And this showed an unacceptably high one-year mortality of 4.6 percent for uh, uh, bariatric surgery. The, uh, this, under the uh, umbrella of accreditation, dr was dramatically reduced between 2002 and 2009. And we took a look at this, Dr. Morton took a look at this in accredited and unaccredited centers and found that in this large study, not only was it, was it less costly to have bariatric surgery in an accredited center, but also the mortality was significantly lower. And we look at that bottom uh, uh, row, a failure to rescue has become an important concept. What we found that might be a mechanism here is that in unaccredited centers, the rates of death from failure to rescue were significantly higher than in accredited centers. 
So looking at that, and again, you've seen this before, uh, a number of studies published, 13, including over one and a half million pa uh, patients, we find that in six of eight, the mortality is significantly better in accredited studies, and there's a preponderance of evidence to show that risk-adjusted outcomes are better in uh, accredited bariatric surgical centers. Toward this end, some of the largest payers in our country require accreditation uh, to participate in their uh, bariatric center of excellence programs. And here is the, the data, the most current data from MBSA Equip uh, for, for calendar year 2016, showing that the uh, overall mortality is 0.11% for all comers in bariatric surgery. The second, and just as important, is, is this is really the best way that we can address uh, and bridge care gaps. A part of uh, uh, the uh, pillar of the accreditation program is continuous quality improvement. Not only data collection, as you heard from Dr. Hunter, but uh, all centers are mandated to use that data to develop continuous quality improvement pro projects. This also allows us on a bro to develop broader quality improvement projects across the country. The current one we call Energy is a project looking at enhanced recovery for bariatric surgery. This encompasses preoperative, intraoperative, and postoperative care. And a very important area that we're, uh, we're focusing on in this enhanced recovery program is what we call multimodality uh, narcotic pain use. We are trying to completely eliminate or significantly reduce narcotic use both intraoperatively and postoperatively in our bariatric patients. And in a program that we did piloted at Geisinger, we were able to accomplish that in almost 40% of our patients. Uh, as we all know, this is very costly. About 25% of the cost of readmissions uh, uh, comes from surgical patients. And our first quality improvement project that was done nationally is, is the drop that you heard alluded to before. Um, you've seen the outcomes in drop that show that about, uh, uh, that uh, uh, there's an overall reduction of readmissions of about 10%. But most importantly, we measure adherence to protocols. McGlynn showed that there are about 55% of patients in this country do not get the intended care. And this, in this way, we, we make sure that 90% of our patients get that care. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, we have three non-scheduled uh, speakers. Uh, I want to remind everyone you have one minute to deliver your comments. The first is from Ted Kyle. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. My name is Ted Kyle. I am a pharmacist from Pittsburgh, founder of Conscient Health, a member of the board of directors of the Obesity Action Coalition, advocacy advisor to the Obesity Society. Uh, we are in the midst of a, an epidemic of chronic diseases uh, which result from untreated obesity. We have a limited range of tools for managing this disease and different people respond very differently and have very different needs in dealing with this condition. People need options for dealing with obesity, otherwise the disease progresses and results in catastrophic effects on a person's health over a lifetime. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comments. Um, second speaker is Michael Rothkopf. Thank you for the opportunity to comment on today's proceedings. My name is Dr. Michael Rothkopf. I'm a metabolic internist from Morristown, New Jersey. I'm also the president of the National Board of Physician <coughs> Nutrition Specialists, which is a group of about 600 physicians who are nutritionally oriented. I do have a disclosure. I have a patent on the uh, pharmaceutical enhancement of diabetes resolution using incretin pharmacotherapy in combination with gastric restriction. My, my comment to the group today is simply to highlight the importance of the involvement of nutritionally oriented physicians, internists, family medicine doctors in the management of the bariatric patients. And this involves preoperative uh, management, postoperative complications, and especially the enhancement of outcomes using uh, combination therapy with pharmaco pharmacotherapy along with surgery and adjustment of medications after bariatric surgery. Thank you. Thank you. And the last is Robin Blackstone. Thank you for allowing me to speak. My name is Robin Blackstone. I'm a professor of surgery at the University of Arizona. And um, I wanted to talk with you about two things. When I moved my practice to the downtown inner city hospital of Phoenix, 
I saw people who have failed to be treated for this disease for a very long time. Obesity is a disease of physiology, not choice. And this disease becomes metabolically inflexible. And the group of people who gain weight very fast at that point, they gain weight very fast. Surgery is not the only treatment for this disease. Education of our young people at the university setting is crucial. But I want to stress that without the support of a benefit for bariatric surgery and for other forms of therapy, we are leaving this group of people who is a very substantial group of people in our society befret of any type of treatment. It's important that Medicare realizes what the benefit that Medicare provides means in this country, because without it, no other insurance company will cover it. Pardon the interruption. Thank you for your comments. Okay, we're going to resume uh, the rest of the program at uh, an hour from now at 1245. Thank you.